<laughs> There's probably nobody. Everybody's asleep right now. Okay. So, be nice to these speakers. Uh, below the video, uh, when it when it archives and comes up, is that's playable. Below the video will be all the instructors' names and in which in the order in which they taught, the classes they taught, and if they have a YouTube uh, moniker, I will put that out beside their name. Um, and I'll, if I'm not too lazy, I'll put a timestamp by each speaker so you can just click and go right to theirs. Uh, but these guys are here taking an instructor class. And there are going to be people out there that are going to, it happens every year when I put the instructor class up, some of you motherfuckers are out there like, oh, he said um 13 times. Fuck you, man. Like, you fucking bring your ass down here and fucking talk in front of this camera, live in front of a studio audience and a YouTube audience. Let's see how well you do. Anybody that counts ohms is a fucking dickhead anyway. I told people, I told the class earlier, that's not a dude you'd want to fucking, like, go to a party with. He'd be like, this this French onion dip, this is, these are not French onions. These are Louisiana onions. He's that kind of motherfucker. Like, who would even know that? <laughs> <laughs> Crystal, are you ready? All right, so I'm going to introduce the MC that's going to introduce the whole thing, Cristal. Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome again to this live stream. We're here on day five of the tactical instructor course. Uh, I and 13 of my peers are very excited to present to you uh, a culminating presentation incorporating everything we've learned this week, which is quite a bit. Uh, so just making that short and sweet so we can go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is going to be Micah Mays. He will be speaking on the best way to win a fight. So welcome, Micah. Thank you, Crystal. Good morning. Good morning. If I can give you four critical points to winning 99% of the possible fights you will ever get into in your whole life, I'm going to do it right now. So listen up. The best way to win a fight, bar none, is to not be in one. I know. People are like, well, I train, I train guns. I know karate. I've got boxing, kung fu. All those things are very, very expensive if you go to court. Okay? So the best way to win that fight is to avoid it. There are four keys to avoiding a fight. Number one is awareness. Number two is avoidance. Number three is deterrence. And number four is de-escalation. Let me run these down for you right now. And listen up, because it might save you time in jail. We're going to start off with awareness. First key to awareness is putting your phone down. Put it away. You don't need it right now. If you're out in public, you should be paying attention to what's going on around you. How do you do that? By keeping our head up. Keeping our head up, our eyes open, and surveying our surroundings. Be aware of your environment and the people and things in it. You, know, you want to ask yourself, if you're in a parking lot, like Walmart, you're starting to get out of your car, is anyone out of place? There are people going to the store, there are people coming from the store. But is there anyone that's not doing one of those things? If a person is moving outside of the pattern of regular human movement, they may have intent that is not good for you. So, if they're acting differently than others, that means they have a different purpose than other people have. Okay? If you're in your neighborhood, if you're like me, I live in a large neighborhood, I don't know my neighbors, for the most part. I know their cars, I know where they're supposed to be, I know at what time they come and go, but I am not involved in their day-to-day -day lives. So, for me, the presence of a strange vehicle on my street acting oddly, that's going to draw my attention. First thing I think of when I think of that is the scene from the movie Friday when you got Ice Cube and Chris Tucker sitting on the porch and they look at the street and see a car moving slowly by. Who did that coming up? Creep it. And at that point they both realize, drive by and dive for cover. 
Okay? <laughs> it's because they were at least paying attention to their surroundings. No matter what else they might have been up to. Okay, so listen to your little lizard brain. Your spidey sense. If you get an idea that there is something wrong in the back of your mind, there is something that your subconscious has picked up on in your environment that has just not gotten through to the human brain yet. Listen to that. Because if the hairs go up on the back of your neck, there is a problem. You just haven't identified it yet. And if there is a problem, you should probably just avoid it. You do that by avoidance. Point two. If you're in a vehicle, you see something that makes you ill at ease, leave. It's that long one on the right. You put your foot on that, you point the tires in an appropriate direction, and you leave the situation. Okay? Just, just leave. It really doesn't matter what you had planned to do. Um, if you're going to be involved in a violent incident, uh, wouldn't it be better to just reschedule? Go do that later. If you're on foot, uh, change direction. If you see, if you're walking down the sidewalk and you see a group of disenfranchised youths with nothing better to do on their time, on their hands, move to the other side of the street. Rethink it. Do I really need to walk past these guys? Can I just turn around and go back the way I came? If that's the situation, fine. You see a problem? Avoid it. Avoid it as quickly as you can without running, without attracting extra attention. The reason why I say that is because criminals are predators. If they see someone in distress, as Hannibal Lecter once said, when the wolf hears the rabbit scream, it comes a running, but not to help. Do not show signs of distress. Show a sign, a project an air of possession of the area around you and simply move on with whatever you needed to do. If you are in a store and you see an altercation, particularly between a couple, do not get involved in that. Never get involved in a domestic problem, okay? We have dedicated men and women of law enforcement that have to deal with that all the time. You do not want to be involved in that. Ask anyone that you know in law enforcement how interfering in a domestic goes. If you're in a, so if you are in the store, there in front of your chunky peanut butter that you wanted to get is going to create dishbowl effect. If someone decides that they are going to attempt to, say, rob you, you are funneled into that area. You do not have much in the way of escape. So avoid ATMs whenever possible. Um, don't interact with panhandlers. If someone is trying to get your attention for something and it's not your problem, it's not your problem. We do that by deterrence. The third point. So, as I said before, we want to move with purpose, always. Head up. We're going where we're going. It doesn't matter what else is going on. We're doing our thing. Okay? If someone tries to get your attention, hey man, you got five, you got five bucks, man. You got a dollar. You got smoke, man. Now oh, come on, man. No. Raise one hand in a talk to the hand gesture, point it at them, and say, I can't help you. I'm not interested. No, thank you. Okay? Now, in society, a lot of people are like, well, that's rude. That's not my problem. There are two kinds of problems in this world. There is my problem and not my problem. That's my problem and not my problem. So, you do not engage in conversation with a panhandler. Move on, do your business. If they are outside a store that you are trying to get to, go in, do your business, 
make space between yourself and them when you leave. If I have walked around the front of my car to go to the store, and this person has decided to position themselves in front of my car, when I come back out, I will walk around the back of the car, giving myself physical distance between them. Plus, when I open the car door, I don't have my back to them. I have the car door to them. I will get in, I will lock my doors, I will put it in gear, and I will leave. Now, if they were to have an accomplice that waiting to smack you in the head with a brick when you stopped to respond to their question, they may still be in the area, so you want to keep stay aware and alert as you are leaving the area. If someone walks behind your car as you're trying to back out, you want to be polite, give them a moment to move out of the way. If they don't, <clears throat> give your engine a little rev, maybe beat the horn. If they continue to not move out of your way, well, and if someone else is moving in on you, then you probably just need to go ahead and leave and hopefully they'll move in time. Um, at night, a good flashlight, and even during the day with some of the better flashlights, a good flashlight is an excellent deterrent. Um, any flashlight over 500 lumens, which there are a lot of nowadays, small pocket flashlights, um, at night it can be shined towards the feet so that they know, hey, well, they can see me now. Maybe they'll reconsider and back off. If they don't, shine it in the eyes because that will definitely get their attention, blind them, and give you time to make your way out of the situation. The last one, our last solution would be de-escalation. Uh, a lot of people don't like it, but it's really simple. It doesn't take a lot of time, okay? In a de-escalation situation, apologize, particularly when it's not your fault. Like, oh man, I am so sorry. I did not mean to just back off. As you're apologizing, continue to back off. Make that space between yourself and the other person. Leave the situation once you've made that space, if you can. Go ahead, move to your car, or whatever ride you have, and get out of that situation. If you are, for example, in a bar, and some guy decides he's gonna stagger nine steps and bump into you and spill his beer and then blame it on you. So, oh man, I am so sorry I spilled your beer. Oh God, what can I, let me, let me buy you another beer. Let me buy you another beer. Just stay right here, let me go up and get you another beer. Go up to the counter, if he's paying attention to you, fine, buy him another beer. Have, him, have it sent over and leave. Someone that's that intoxicated is going to simmer in a grudge, okay? It's not gonna get any better. Just go ahead and leave, okay? If you are out in public, or maybe you decided that you just had to go to that ATM, and someone comes up with a gun or knife and says, give me your money. Your first reaction should not be, you can't have my damn money. Okay, your first reaction, oh my God, dude, please, please. Uh, no, I got my wallet right here. Don't take my, don't, don't hurt me, man. Don't, here, there's my money, Let's take my money. And then you leave, okay? It doesn't matter about the money that you just dropped on the floor. You know, you've got a job, work some overtime, make it back. What you can't do is try risk your life over some, pa some paper, plastic and leather. So I've given you four keys today for avoiding fights, avoiding violent encounters, okay? That is to be aware, avoid the situations, deter them when you can't avoid them, and de-escalate them if you couldn't deter them. So the next time 
that you're out in public, think about this. What would happen? What should I do if someone approaches me in a manner that I find aggressive, in a manner that's not welcome to me? Awareness, avoidance, deterrence, and de-escalation might keep you out of jail. Thank you very much. And up next we have Zach, who is going to talk to us about the martial path of a police officer. Welcome, Zach. Thanks, Micah. Hello, my name is Zach Bush. Uh, like Micah said, I'm a police officer from Indiana, and the presentation today is going to be titled The Martial Path of a Police Officer. And before I get into kind of what that means as far as for the purpose of the presentation, I just kind of want to ask everybody, uh, what are some of the um, qualities that you guys think that police officers should have as far as training? Anyone? Strength. Strength? Ability to fight. Okay. Ability to fight? Judgment. Judgment? All right, good. So when we talk about training, uh, every, every state has... Uh, requirements uh, for how many hours that their police officers have to be trained, a minimum number of hours. Um, and it varies from state to state. Um, does anyone want to guess how many hours, just in general, police officers are required to 60. train every year? 60? 100. 100? 40. 40? Okay. So, got a good range there. Um, I'm going to write down in my state how many hours police officers are required to train. And this is from the state of Indiana. Six. <laughs> now, for the fellow Marines out there watching, that's when the big hand is pointing down at the bottom of the box. <laughs> but that's the required number in my state. Every state's different, but that's mine. And actually, if you break that number down more, out of those six, two hours, Two of those hours are what they call in-service slash mandated. There's all kinds of names for it. Basically, two of those hours are already predetermined by my state, and that's to deal with autism and other, other things that police officers routinely run into. So really, when you look at the number six and you take away the two hours that you're already mandated for other things, that's really what you're required in my state to do per year minimum. And then when you start to break this number down, you're gonna look at firearms, driving, physical tactics, and that's the number. This is the magic number right here. So that's kind of how this presentation came to be, is when I realized this number, I thought I had to start getting myself some more training. And as I took my first class, which was Fighting Pistol here at Tactical Response, I started getting a lot of questions from other cops about what class should I take. And at that time it was easy, it was Fighting Pistol because that was a class that I had just taken. But as I took Fighting Pistol, I realized there were a lot of other areas that I was deficient in. So it became other classes. And this one simple answer of what class should I take turned into a list, which is what I consider to be the martial path of a police officer. So out of this list, I narrowed it down to five things. And these are five things that I think make a great cop. The first one is firearms training. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Obviously, you probably saw that one coming. The trick to this one is that it has to be of a fighting mindset. There are different kinds of firearms training, and not all of them are equal. You should look for a course, like I said, that emphasizes fighting. That is not just shooting holes in a piece of paper. And if it's a good course, if it's a good firearms course, it will lead you to other courses. It will inspire you to perhaps fill in the rest of this list. It will inspire you to take more firearms training. It will show you that what you know isn't a whole lot. And like I said before, an example of a good firearms course, of course, is Fighting Pistol. There are other ones out there, but I would recommend Fighting Pistol for anyone that has not had any firearms training. The second category is 
mixed martial arts. Now, I know that's kind of a general term for anyone out there that practices any kind of martial art, but just for the people here watching in this room, someone throw out what martial arts they think are good for a police officer to have a background in. Boxing. Okay. Boxing. BJJ. BJJ. Okay. Anybody else? Krav Maga. Krav Maga. All right. So, I would argue that there are three types of martial arts, or three martial arts, that are, that should be the foundation for any police officer. And those are boxing, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and wrestling. One of those three, or all of them, uh, I think would make a great foundation for any kind of police officer wanting to get into martial arts. Now, your martial art that you get into <coughs> should be testable. And what I mean by that is you should be able to drill it with an active opponent. So you should be able to box somebody when they're trying to hit you. Or you should be able to roll around on the ground with someone who's trying to actively resist you. Because that's how it works. And so some examples of not only besides Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, boxing, or wrestling, uh, there are some classes out there. There is uh, Extreme Close Quarters Concepts with Craig Douglas. There's Full Contact Gunfighting with Aaron Little. Uh, those are great combatives classes that will also, again, lead you down the path to either getting involved in a martial art or just lead you down the path, um, uh, that martial path. And finally, in regards to the martial art stuff, it should be a martial art that kind of supplements some kind of workout program. So you should be tired at the end of these workouts. It should be almost a workout in and of itself. The third category is fitness. And fitness, of course, is just a general name, kind of like martial arts, it's just a general category name. When I'm talking about fitness, I'm talking about strength training. I'm talking about learning how to lift heavy things, and just put them down, and then do that over and over again. Because strength makes you better at everything. And the, the convenient part about strength training is it generally doesn't, it's not that complicated to learn how to do it, and it doesn't take a lot of expensive equipment. And that's to say that the, for a police officer, it's important to have a small amount of explosive strength than to be a marathon runner, for example. If I asked you guys, you, you had to fight one of two people, the guy who can deadlift 450 pounds or the guy who runs marathons, who are you gonna pick to fight? You're probably gonna pick the marathon runner even though he's in shape. So I want you to think about um, who you would wanna fight if you had to in that scenario and then be the other person. And in regards to cops, just to simplify this point about fitness in general, Again, I, I, I recommend strength training. Fitness in general, you just can't be fat. You just, you cannot be overweight in this profession. And if you are, it is going to be a detriment to anything else that you're trying to do. The fourth category is medical training. And when I talk about medical training, I talk about trauma medical training. So the training should be trauma-centered uh, learning how to deal with gunshot wounds or traumatic injuries involving heavy uh, blood loss, things like that. And this point goes back to the idea that you've heard in, the, in civilian classes and you've heard it uh, in other forms of training, you are much more likely to save a life with your medical than you ever are to save a life with your firearm, although both are possible. Um, a personal example for me is I've been a police officer for over 10 years. I've, I've had three different cases where I've had to put a tourniquet on somebody and I've yet to have one where I've actually had to shoot somebody. So um, the importance of medical is, is unquestionable. That's, that's why it's one of the categories. Uh, these categories, of course, are in no specific order. Um, it's more of a generalized list. And the example I would give for a good trauma medical class is Immediate Action Medical here at Tactical Response. There are other companies that do a great job as well. but immediate action medical attack response is, is probably the first place I would point somebody. And the fifth category is communication.
And communication is a general term for just knowing how to talk to people. Just knowing how to have a conversation with somebody. There are people that are automatically gifted at doing that in life, and there are some people that struggle with it. It is a skill as a cop that you have to have. Being able to effectively communicate is what separates a good cop from either a shitty cop or a cop who's brand new. So if we use the Larry example, Larry the cop, Larry, Larry could have none of the first four things that I just, I just mentioned. He could, he could you know, shoot once a year with this department, you know, somewhere within this four hours window. He could shoot once a year, never practiced martial art in his life, you know, overweight, and still thinks the tourniquets are bad. But if Larry can talk to people as a cop, if Larry is good at communicating with people, Larry's probably one of the best cops you have in your department. That's how important communication is. These four things are extremely important, but as a cop, if you can communicate with people, you, you are an excellent cop. That's just how it is. And in police work, I've always been told, the biggest thing that will get you in trouble in police work is your mouth. And that can mean a bunch of different things. As far as the actual field operational side, knowing how to, how to talk to people is extremely important. And finally, being, being able to talk somebody out of a fight is still a win. That's, if you talk somebody out of shooting you, that's, then you still won, whether you have to shoot them or not. So these are the five things that I think make up the martial path to a police officer. And these are, again, the five skills that I think every cop should have or every cop should be working towards. And the funny thing is, is as I was writing this list, as I was writing it with the mindset of like, you know, I want cops to watch this and listen to this, I, I realized something that this is not just a list for cops. This is a list for everybody. This is, this is something that everybody in this room, everybody watching should look at this list and say, you know, I've done this or I've done that, but like this whole fitness thing, like I don't even know what he's talking about with strength training. Or I've never thought that I need to work on my communication skills more than what they already are. I've never thought of, I, I should get somebody's opinion about my communication skills that's at a professional level. Um, and so what I would encourage everybody to do is look at this list and figure out where they are deficient at and what they could work on. Because we all have at least one thing on here that we could work on and then try to find some kind of a some some kind of a class that can help you expand upon the category that you feel like you are weakest in and then you know whether that's take a class or whether that's you know if you're someone who doesn't lift weights very often you know find a buddy that lifts weights and go ask him how to do it or if you don't have any idea about what martial art you want to get involved in, find a buddy that does something and ask to hang, you know, ask to hang, hang out with him. So again, in conclusion, look at this list and figure out kind of what, what you think that you could be better at and be that. Be, be that cop that you want responding to you, whether it's strength or firearms proficiency. Find that person that you want responding to your emergency and be that person. So, with that being said, I'm going to bring up Cameron, who's going to talk about the difference between sport and combative training. Cameron? Hello, everyone. Uh, so, much as fighting pistol is an ethics and mindset class disguised as a shooting class, I'm actually talking about honesty and self-awareness, and we're disguising that as a martial arts talk. So, I want you to kind of keep that in mind. First, we're going to talk about, uh, excuse me, we're going to characterize the relationship between sports and combat and how, what they have with mindset, tactics, skill, and gear. How they approach these things. Then we're going to talk about human psychology and evolution. We're going to relate that to how this creates that table and then what that really means for us. So, what's the relationship that sports training has to gear? It's primarily about maximizing performance, it's about getting as fast as possible or doing the thing the best. 
the skills for sports, the relationship that those have, you're trying to do the skill the best. It's about attaining some level of perfection, whether that's um, how you box or how hard you hit or accuracy or speed. It's about skill. Sports are mostly competition around skills. The tactics. Sports tactics are largely predetermined. I mean, they're, they're set up by what the sport is, right? The tactics of baseball are always the same. The tactics of boxing are always the same. It's do the game the best, you know? Punch that guy, here and now. We'll come back to the mindset part. What about in combat? The gear is about reliability. And what's the most important function or uh, aspect of self-defense tool? Reliability. It has to work every time and it has to work now. What about the skills? Combat skills need to be simple and to be easy to remember and perform under stress when you have that crazy adrenaline dump. And what about tactics? The tactics of combatives training are fluid. They're I hate to use this word because it's kind of uh, cliche for us now, but they're dynamic. They're constantly evolving. You know, stop, this is a robbery. Now get in the van. That situation changed, and how we react needs to change too. So, why are these, why are there two columns? Why don't these things interact the same way? It's almost like they were made with two different minds, because functionally they kind of work. Latest of all, this is the human brain, our logical, rational, problem-solving center. It's a constant struggle for control between these three structures. We are effectively all three of these at once. We like to think of ourselves as this, that part of you that's saying, I am me, that lives here. That's where the superego, that, ide that identity of self lives. But you're, that's not true. You're wrong. You are literally all three of these. You're a monkey riding a T-Rex with a very small leash. <laughs> you have to understand that about yourself. That's part of that self-awareness we're building towards. So, monkey problems, monkey conflicts, are largely social. Because monkeys are social creatures, much like human beings are. To the monkey brain, Social conflict, concerns about social standing, are literally the same as life and death situations. Because if a monkey is kicked out of its troop, it's out there on its own, it's not going to last long, and I mean, no matter how hard you try, you can't reproduce on your own. So, the monkey brain thinks social conflict and social positioning is the same as a life or death reaction. Which is how we convince ourselves, well, we'll come back to that. Because at the time it was, and that was also true for early human beings. In the Homo sapiens arrived on the planet about 200,000 years ago, and we were largely the same, right? Where social status was our primary means of surviving, staying part of the group, being part of the group, and our position within the social hierarchy, much like monkeys, was largely determined by our capacity for violence. The biggest and strongest are closer to the top, they get more resources, and eventually access to reproduction. That was true for us at the time as well. Now, about 80,000 years ago, we don't really understand why. We have some interesting theories about it, but suddenly we got smart. There's a, a rapid increase in complexity of tools, amount of tools, and we also develop the capacity for language. Then, later on, about 10,000 years ago, we developed agriculture, and we start creating permanent settlements. And these two things, and also an abundance of resources, we're not nearly as uh, close to starvation all the time as hunter-gatherers. And what these things do is they, they fundamentally changed how we had to interact with each other. No longer were we competing to be at the top of the pyramid of social hierarchy by our capacity for violence. Because we had tools with which to resolve social conflicts that were not violence, we had language and empathy, and those conflicts had lower stakes. We were not as close to starvation. We had much more resources. <clears throat> And what that means is our, our, the way we interact with each other changed. So now there's, we, there's means of climbing a whole bunch of different social pyramids to get access to re resources and reproduction. We don't have to specialize in violence. 
And what that meant is that our relationship as a species would finally change. It was no longer acceptable to jockey for social positioning, resources, and control with violence. That's true even among the people who choose to be interested in violence, to learn about it, to study it, to walk that martial path. That used to be everybody, and you used to have to play hard. That's not the case anymore. It's not possible for people who are interested, naturally inclined, to the study of violence to compete with each other in different ways. And in fact, we have to. We, we don't really want to see, as much as some people say, like, oh, yeah, I wish, wish the UFC went further. You don't, really. They don't either. <laughs> they don't actually want to kill each other. Um, and so what we do is we create these proxy competitions for that violent capacity. Because we, A, it's unacceptable to go further, and B, we don't want to. That's what's going to start to create this distinction between these two things. Because the stakes are different in these proxy competitions, there are rules, there are limitations, it's happening here and now, there's no surprises, and it's fundamentally monkey brain stress. The endocrine response, the hormones you experience from this kind of stress, from this brain, is different, fundamentally, than this brain. Because those things are different, the rules are determined, the responses are different, it's not the same competition. We start, to, and as we start to try and climb the social ladders created by those competitions, we get involved and invested in climbing the fake ladder. Or not, it's not fake, it's, it's a different game. You're playing a social positioning game based around the mastery of skills that are relevant to combat, but that's not the same as actually training for combat. So, you need to understand that. You need to understand this about yourself, that you are the monkey riding T-Rex. You're the T-Rex riding monkey. You are playing a myriad number of different social positioning hierarchical games for access to resources and status which will allow you to reproduce. And those are not the same as the original game that the martial game is derived from martial games are derived from. So we have to be honest with how and why they're different, and also what it is we're doing, and why we're doing it. So I, I want you to think about that. What are you doing, why you're doing it, and how you might want to adjust what you're doing to what you want to do or what you think you're doing. So if you're interested in learning more on that, I encourage you to read the books of uh, Colonel Dave Grossman, like On Combat and On Killing, absolutely fascinating as well as for more on human evolution, uh, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. It's <laughs> really mind-blowing. And then for more on human interactions and how we have these different games and how to interact with other people and recognize the, the kind of scripts they're on, what ladders they're trying to climb, uh, Police Sergeant Rory Miller has some great books called uh, Meditations on Violence as well as Conflict Communication. And of course, uh, follow Dr. Jordan B. Peterson for more on human psychology. Thank you. With that, I'd like to introduce Garrett, who's going to talk about low light tactics. Well, hello, everybody. We have some flashlights up here. And tonight, or today, we're going to talk about low light and kind of why that is important. Kind of the first thing I'm going to start off with here is the question <clears throat> Who here gets a little bit anxious in the dark? Nerves go up a little bit, get a little, you know, kind of, oh my God, what's going to go on? Now we're going to kind of answer that question of why does that happen? Well, to answer the question, pretty simple. Humans, visual creatures. We have to be able to see stuff so that we can input that information into our brain and then make a decision on what's going on. If I can't see something, that's a visual stimulus that I can't put into my brain and then make decisions and because I can't do that that's what raises my anxiety level so now that we kind of know why we get a little bit anxious when it gets dark and why that's kind of important we're going to talk about some reasons why we or how we can fix that so the first thing is darkness is something we're just going to have to deal with we can't you know it can never not be dark about half the time the sun's up, the other half the time the sun's down. The sun provides us light, so when there's no sun, yep. we don't have that light, so we can't see very well. 
The other one is, we're humans, we live in structures. We have houses, <coughs> buildings, other things that we go into every single day. Uh, and inside those buildings, it blocks the natural light. So we have to have artificial light, you know, the lights inside your house. Since those are made by humans, everything fails. Uh, there are times when those lights will go out and we won't be able to see inside those buildings. So we're gonna to have to have some way to deal with that kind of stress uh, because of not being able to see. So let's start off real quick is there's some different types of lights that we might have to use. First one would be a handheld flashlight. There's all sorts of different sizes that we can have. You know, there's some are larger than others, uh, but the handheld it goes into the hand so I can move it around however I see fit. Next one we might have is a weapon mounted light. The light is mounted to the weapon. This, as far as useful, it is useful, but it is limited because anywhere that I point this light at, my gun's also pointed. So there's a lot of things that I want to be able to see that I don't want to point my gun at. So as being useful, it is very useful, but we also have to know what the limitations are of that. The other one that we always get talked about real quick is lasers. You know, and for this portion of the discussion, we're not really going to talk much about lasers. Uh, what I will say is a laser is an aiming device of some sort. It is not a low light kind of device. It can be used in low light, but it really is more of an aiming device than an uh, object that will help me see in the dark. So, now that we've talked about flashlights, one of the most useful, like I said, is the handheld light because I can hold it in my hand and move it around. So what do I want with this? Basically, I want this to be as bright as I, it can be. The reason I want it to be as bright is because the brighter it is, the more input that I can have into my brain and the more stuff that I can see. The other thing that I would like it to have is a tail cap that is a push cap. So when I push it, the light goes on. When I release it, the light goes off. Kind of the reason that we would want something along those lines is under stress, the nerves are not as sensitive. So I can't feel on how hard I'm pressing or how hard I'm not pressing. And I don't want to activate this light by accident when I'm in that kind of uh, very stressful situation. I also don't want the light to stay on after I've pressed it because that might be bad too because I, I want to be able to turn this light on when I want to and turn it off when I want to and not have to think, uh, did I click it and is it going to stay on or did I not click it? You know, just more information that I probably don't want to think about. So what does the light help us do? Well, basically kind of two things. It helps us see and identify things around us, especially threats. So if I can see a threat, then I can react to that and figure out what's going on. The other thing that's kind of useful is it can be used as concealment. If I shine this right at somebody, it blinds them and it masks what I'm trying to do and everything behind this light that is going on. So I can mask my movement or other people's movement by shining the light at someone into their eyes, overloading that sense, and then they won't be able to see kind of what's going on. So as far as the light goes, when we're looking at the actual beam of light, we have kind of two different ones. <clears throat> if I activate this light onto the whiteboard, you'll notice that there is a center beam that is very distinct. That is called the primary beam. That is where all this light is focused. And then you have this ring that goes around that primary beam, and that's the secondary beam. We have the primary and the secondary. Depending on where this light is focused, it's going to be how big that primary beam and secondary beam are. There's other lights that really don't have a primary and secondary beam. The whole light pattern is approximately the same brightness. So kind of the benefits to either one is if I'm trying to do some tactics where I need a very bright center, then I'm going to use one that has a primary beam that is very focused. 
if I'm looking for something kind of a general use, but I don't want that primary beam as focused and I want more light in the whole spectrum of where this is shown, then one of the, a flashlight that does not have a very focused primary beam is probably going to be the way that I'm going to go. So now we're talking about the flashlight and how I'm going to use this. Basically what I need to think about is when I activate this flashlight, me as a person behind it, I know where the flashlight beam starts and where the flashlight beam ends. And the only information that I can intake is anything that is inside this beam of light. Anything outside this beam of light is still dark and I can't see that. What we kind of have to be at least aware of is any person or bad guy who's outside this beam of light has all the information. They can see where I'm at, where I'm going, and what I can see, even though I can't tell what's going on with them. That gives them a huge advantage. So with that being said, what I have to do is be aware that I can only see what's inside the light and others can see what's going on if they're not inside this light. That'll kind of lead on to some of the tactics that we use uh, going forward. So the next one we're gonna talk about is, you know, kind of how am I gonna hold this and how am I gonna use this the best that I can to get the different tasks accomplished that need to be accomplished. So the first one we're gonna kind of talk about real quick uh, is what's called the Harry's method. Uh, I'm gonna hold the flashlight to where my thumb can activate the pressure switch on the back of the light. If I'm pointing the gun in, I'm gonna take the hand that has the flashlight, I'm gonna go under that, and I'm gonna put the back of my hands together so I can activate the light, which puts the light on the right side of the gun. This is beneficial if I'm clearing a corner that has an opening to the right because the light is gonna shine into that room, not bounce like off that wall and kind of light me up. Next one we're gonna talk about real quick is a Rogers. Uh, it's also kind of called the syringe method. There's, there's a few different names for it. I'm gonna hold the flashlight in between my fingers and put the activation cap against my thumb so when I squeeze, it turns the light on. And I'm gonna put it right on the support side of the firearm holding in so when I can just press and activate the light in there. This puts the light on the left side of the gun, which would be beneficial if I'm clearing a room that has a corner on the left side. Once again, puts that light into the room and doesn't bounce off anything uh, and cause problems. The other one I might be looking at is a neck index. Neck index is basically I'm taking the flashlight, kind of holding it up <coughs> by my head. I can do it on my left side, you can do it on my right side, either one will work just fine as I move this light around. This light is kind of like a tank turret. Wherever my eyes go, the light goes, which is kind of beneficial. The last one we talked about, kind of interesting, uh, is what's called the FBI method. The FBI method started with the arm extended all the way out, and I can activate the light with my arm fully extended. Does anybody know kind of where that came from? Lanterns. That is correct. The old, uh, old school when you used to have to have a lantern, you didn't have a handheld flashlight, yeah. you hold that lantern up and that would help you see. So the FBI thought, well, we'll just hold the flashlight up there too. Mm -hmm. Kind of where everything goes to. So now that we kind of <coughs> talked about real quick on how we can hold this flashlight in different places and use it. We're going to talk a little bit about some tactics with using this light to the most of our advantage. First one is going to be called umbrella lighting. Basically, I'm going to take the light and I'm going to shine it straight up, bouncing it off the ceiling. These are very beneficial when I have a ceiling that is in a light color and is fairly low. So if I hit that light, the light will bounce off of the ceiling, illuminating the room around me so I can see what's going on and I don't have to be chasing things with my light. I can come in real quick, bounce it off the ceiling, see what's going on. Also, anybody who is with me can also use my light 
and see everything that's going on inside this room. In those cases where I might not have a ceiling that is low enough or it's really high or it's dark, I can do the same thing with the baseboard on the wall. I can hit that baseboard, it will bounce light off into this area, allow me to see and also allow my teammates to see what's going on. Another one that we find kind of useful, it's basically, it's called the eye sweep. That if I'm gonna go into a room and I wanna kinda of see everything that's going on, I can take this light about eye level and just swipe it across. What this is gonna do is two things. Allows me to see what's inside of that room. Also, if anybody who's standing in that room is gonna get this light in their eyes, which is gonna cause them basically not be able to see, gives me concealment uh, and possibly distracts them, messes with their OODA loop. So they're gonna have to kind of think now what's going on. So like we talked about with the light, what I'm really trying to do is I want to project this light into rooms. I don't want to bounce it off different objects. Kind of what happens unfortunately is if I shine this onto a wall, that light bounces off the wall hits me and illuminates me, gives my position away, but does not benefit me at all. So if I'm trying to clear a corner with the light, if I keep that light on, the problem I have is everybody can see where I'm at, what direction I'm moving and how far I'm moving. So we kind of look at now what do I do? So what I'm gonna to wanna to have is the flashlight's gonna be on and I see what's going on turn the flashlight off, and then I'm gonna to move to a different position. Turn the flashlight on again, move to a different position. So the light's on, see what's going on, light off, I move. This is the case, so if there's somebody out there, they don't know exactly where I'm at, they just see the light come on, light go off, and then the light goes on somewhere else, so they can't track my position as far as where I'm going provides me the most safety, but also allows me to move through structures. Last one we're gonna talk about real quick is what's called a quick peek. Basically a quick peek is if I'm gonna look into the room and I wanna see what's going on in there, but I really don't wanna go into that room uh, at this point in time. I'm gonna look in real quick, activate my light, turn off my light, and then I'm gonna get behind cover. So it's look, turn the light on, turn the light off, come back out, and now I'm gonna think in my brain, what did I just see? What's going on in there? Kind of like a Polaroid. Just come out, take that quick picture, get back behind cover. Now I'm just letting that Polaroid develop and going, okay, what's going on? <clears throat> so now if we're done that once and we go, I'm not sure what I just saw. I have to do that again. I don't want to go back out in that same spot. I'm going to pick a different spot. So either I'm going to change my elevation if I did standing first, I might do kneeling. If I went out on the right side, I might go out on the left side. Activate real quick, see what's going on for a second time, come back, and then verify what did I see, can I you know, continue on. So we're going to kind of wrap everything up here. Why low light's important. We get that anxious feeling when we work in the dark because we can't see what's going on. We live inside of buildings where lights can go out. We need to have some way to deal with all that uh, darkness in the case of a tactical situation. We have different ways that we can hold the flashlight, you know, Harry's, Roger's, neck. We also wanna make sure that if we're moving with the light we turn the light on, turn the light off, and then continue on and the reasons why we do those different things. We need to take quick looks into rooms. We showed you how to make that quick peek and figure out what's going on. So I'll kind of leave you with this, you know, quick explanation here. Because what we talked about here is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more information regarding low light and how to utilize the flashlight in tactical environments. And I would suggest if this is something that interests you to go get further training on that. So. I will uh, turn the mic over to Mike, who will be talking about how to be a good fighter. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate that. All right, before I get started here, I'd like to uh, 
have a quick thank you to everyone here that showed up to help all of us get better as instructors and uh, especially to you on YouTube I'm very humbled by that by you spending time here with us and uh, and just coming out and supporting us uh, while we, we learn how to do this and uh, be better instructors so in case you uh, missed it or, or uh, forgot what it was in a little spiel my name is Mike Drescher and what I'm going to be talking about today is how to be a good fighter so who here has been skydiving before anybody Boom. Yes. oh yeah sweet two people today all right good deal so uh, has anyone been skydiving and seen someone that they were skydiving with fail to like try to hit their rip cord on their main chute and fail to deploy it so anyone seen that no okay like on YouTube you might see some videos of this or something like that but if you for those of you that have it especially on YouTube here I'm gonna paint that picture for you so they jump out of the plane they're going down they're gonna get life is good and then they go to try to pull the rip cord for their main chute and nothing happens and then okay so a couple of things are gonna happen after that one they're gonna tug a little harder main chute deploys good day second thing is they try to pull it they realize that, that that cord's fouled up they're not going to be able to deploy their main chute they transition to their secondary emergency chute they pull that it works good day uh, the third thing that could happen is if and also if they don't have a secondary chute they panic and when they panic they try with all their might everything they got to pull that fouled up rip cord for the primary chute to try to get that thing to deploy and they're focusing so hard they tunnel vision in on that and they're trying to pull it and it's so difficult for them to pull they they forget what they're what they're actually doing and where they are as they're falling through the sky okay they're in free fall they have nothing to push off with their legs but they're trying to pull that cord so hard that it actually looks like they're walking up an imaginary uh, stair set or ladder because they're trying to use their legs to get extra force to pull that cord we don't get to choose when the fight comes to us, okay? So if you wanna be able to answer that call, you must prepare your mind for battle. If you do not do this, if you do not cultivate a fighter mindset and prepare your mind for battle, it will not matter if your gear is quality or not. It won't matter if the skills, if you've mastered any skills or not. It won't matter if you choose to employ a certain tactic or not, because you have never decided, you will never decide to make, to get into that fight. You'll never make that decision. You'll never get into the fight and you'll, you may quit because you have not cultivated the mindset proper to carry through and, and win the day. So again, to be a good fighter, the mind is the key. I like to leave you, uh, give you a quote here. Uh, John Steinbeck, you probably, you guys have probably heard this, especially on the internet, because you'll look it up right after I say it. I'm just going to paraphrase it. Uh, the mind is the weapon, and all else is supplemental. So I'm going to do a little exercise here, just kind of thinking your head about this. I'm going to say a, a string of words, and I want you to think about what the root word is. Knife fight, fist fight gun fight, pillow fight, uh, water balloon fight. Uh, yeah, the root word is fight in all of those things. And I, what I see, unfortunately, is a lot of time uh, being spent by the majority of people trying to poke holes, learn to learn how to poke holes in paper or hit a heavy bag harder. And these are just skills, okay? They're just trying to learn how to do skills. They're not really cultivating a fighter mindset so if you want to be a better fighter here's a novel idea learn how to fight hey right that's pretty obvious right thank you captain obvious for, <laughs> for that uh, brilliant analogy or brilliant uh, uh, logic I'll be here all day if you have any other uh, tough life questions I'll hook you up right I'll answer it up for you uh, but as obvious and as logical as that is to be a good fighter learn to fight is equally ignored okay so why is this why is uh not just being ignored by most average people well they kind of fall into a trap and i like to call it the uh the gear and skill trap and what this is it's kind of a vicious cycle and they go back and forth back and forth so 
first off, they got their pistol. They're like, yeah, all right, I got my pistol. I am good to go. They think I'm ready. And then they start to actually maybe shooting it a little bit, and they figure out, man, I'm not really good at shooting this pistol as, I, as good as I thought. Like, I'm not very accurate. So they're like, all right, I'm going to replace the sights. That's going to fix that. So then they get some new sights, whatever they may be. Probably the new hottest thing off the internet, whatever. And then they're like, ah, okay, but I need to draw faster. I need to get my speed up. So then they get a new holster or maybe change the position in which they carry with that. So now they're thinking, okay, great. I got a tenth of, tenth of a second shaved off my timer. Uh, off my shot timer with my draw. My accuracy is a little better because I got my new whiz bang sights. But I tell you what, I'm still not getting those shots in there where I want them. And they're not uh, not nearly as fast as I want. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put in hashtag sweet trigger. I'm going to put that nice sweet trigger in there. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm just going to slay, right? I'm going to be able to like skin that smoke wagon and I'm going to be able just to put those rounds in there like, oh, like five under a second, just boom, yeah. That's what they think. So they keep bouncing back and forth. Like I said, it's a trap. So they try to perform a skill, and then they try to get some gear to make them a little bit better at that skill, or at least they think that that's what's gonna happen, and they just bounce back and forth between these two things. And they never really progress beyond this. So in boxing, uh, there's a thing that, that happens, so like, what's better than the gear and the skill, right? So they, you need to progress past that. There's two very important things beyond gears, gear and skills. And if you, if you look at boxing, which I have a little bit of experience in, I've competed, I've done some things with that, and I've trained fighters. And uh, you'll, you'll go to a fight and the announcers will be talking back and forth and be like, hey, we've got a <coughs> hungry young challenger coming up to fight fight the champion. He's got blazing, blazing speed, like super quick guy. And then, and then the other announcer will be like, what do you think about that, Bob? And Bob will turn back to uh, John. He'll say, hey, the champion is seasoned, and I think he will be able to beat that speed with timing. Okay? So timing beats speed, at least in the, uh, and always, but in the uh, boxing world, that's a big thing. That's a big thing that they talk about. And something I tell my fighters is, it's better to be playing chess while your opponent plays checkers. And what that is, is putting it on the big picture. Tactics beat skills. Speed is a skill. Timing is a tactic. Okay? So what trumps tactics? I've been talking about it all morning, pretty much. Several different presentations have brought it up, and, and mine as well. The mindset. Okay? The mindset the, the act to decide to fight and not quit. If you do not do this, it won't matter, like I said before, the tactics you employ, the skills that you have mastered, or the gear that you're using. It won't, none of that will matter. You must decide to fight quickly enough and not quit regardless of the situation that you find yourself in. All right, well, that's great. You figured that out, all right? And you're, you're like, okay, I'm telling you this. So how do you cultivate that fighter mindset. How does it, how do you do this? One word, training. Training is key. Get quality training from a reputable instructor. To do this, you're going to have to do your due diligence. You're going to have to do some research. You're going to have to look some stuff up and figure out, hey, where can I find this? Because not all trainers are created equal and not all of them are going to have this part of the puzzle. So, if you, if you find that good training, they, that trainer will put you on the martial path. And that will get you to where, regardless of the tool in your hand, whether it be your empty hand, the blade, or the firearm, you will learn and you will fight with it, regardless of what it is and regardless of the situation. You will fight. So who here... Has, uh, is a little bit familiar with the Orlando uh, shooting, nightclub shooting that happened not too long ago. Yeah, uh, just a brief summary, what happened? Uh, a gentleman, you know, you know, the madman went in and just mm -hmm. kind of went nuts and murdered a bunch of people and it was a horrible situation. People were forced to cower and mm -hmm. 
no one fought back. I mean, there was yeah. some opportunities. Yeah, you got it exactly right there. So there was 49 killed, 53 wounded in that in that attack. So a dude came in with a rifle and a pistol, and he decided on that day he was going to shoot and murder a lot of innocent people. That's that was the decision he made, and he went in and he did it. Uh, unfortunately. Um, there was no one in there that was a concealed carrier as far and that chose to fight back in in general and what you're going to find out here on the cameras they watched this person they were inside of the nightclub and the attacker would fire into the crowd and he would kill some people and then when the gun went dry he struggled to reload his weapon so much so that there were times of 20 or 30 seconds between firings where he was fumbling around trying to get, get the weapon up and running to where he could fire again uh, into, into the crowds. And we're thinking, well, how did this happen? Like, why would this happen? Like, why wouldn't those people run out? Why wouldn't those people uh, rush them or do something? Well, they had not prepared their mind. Again, we do not get to decide when the fight comes to us. Okay? We don't get to pick when. So we got to be ready before that, obviously. Or this is what this is the kind of thing that can happen. They didn't come after him, and because of that, when he was messing around, loading, load, trying to get that thing loaded, they just tried to hide better. They tried to cower, or they just froze completely and stayed in place. And as soon as he got that thing loaded up, he walked up and he executed them. He slaughtered everyone in that club that he could. So in summary. To be a good fighter, the mind is the key. You must cultivate that fighter mindset. Do this by seeking out quality training with a reputable instructor that will put you on the proper martial path. He will line you out and you will get to where you need to be. In closing, the most important thing I can tell you on being to become a good fighter is learn to fight. Be a good fighter because you know not the hour that the fight will come to you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you all here listening to me and those on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is going to be the hostess with the mostess, Trisha Quinn, and she is going to be speaking about seeking out training and people for your tribe. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Patricia Quinn. Um, uh, Trisha Quinn works well. Uh, if you take the PA off, I automatically lose uh, 20 pounds. It's TRICIA, much like FBI, but more international. Um, you talked about the Marshall Path. Um, I, I'm a little bit on the marshmallow path. Uh, I used to carry outside the waistband, but everybody thought I carried appendix, so I changed. Um, the, um, the goal of my talk today is to encourage everyone to uh, seek out diversity in their training and actually function and practice um, those skills. So we can go to a class and we can get that great gear, but do we function with it? And can we function with it uh, with our teammates, with our family, etc.? cetera? Um, there's lots of different training out there. And we, we think, uh, what's, what's the beginning? First aid. So um, Steve, can you name everything from first aid to surgical trauma surgery? That no. all the training that's in it just just real quick you can do it no there's a lot there's a ton out there and um, there's a uh, you know things that that are gonna <clears throat> evaluate and practice seek um, a perfection or at least um, practical application for rapid response there's first responders uh, there's pre-hospital uh, all, all the way to the ER and, and then all these obviously the trauma surgery and that's what we think about is uh, boo-boo kits, um, band-aids, etc. Um, sometimes we don't think about the long term, uh, the continuum of care, even in a remote setting or, and, and how you're going to function uh, with those people that may need your help. Um, we, um, <clears throat> we're all pack animals. Um, we uh, like to gather together. Even if we think we're isolationists, then we, we kind of gather with the folks that stand off by themselves. It's a, it's a group of people who are standoffish. Um, but like wolves, we, we, we travel together. We have teams, families, crews, um, 
all kinds of different things to think about as far as your group goes. But are you, do you have a medical plan? Have you built um, an idea of what you're going to do? If you're going in the station wagon to, I tell old I am, station wagon. Um, you're going to the station wagon to Six Flags. Have you got a boo-boo kit in there? Do you know where the ER is? Do you know anything about the folks in your, in your group? You know, you got the neighbor's kid with you. Are you thinking about what those, that kid's needs might be? Um, that's a medical plan. That's a medical support plan. It sounds real big and cool, um, but it, it can be as simple as a um, big tin of, of first aid equipment in the, in the back of the car, um, all the way to, to the extreme. So examples would be boo-boo kits, tummy traumas, uh, you know, emergency dental. And you, can you find somewhere to stick some milk until you can get the dentist to show up at the office? Something like that. Um, diarrhea and dehydration, you know, nobody wants to think about that. There's nothing cool and sexy about it, but man, it's an issue, right? So you have to know your teammates. You have to continue to assess, uh, maintain, and then certainly prevent any issues and then be able to be ready to respond. Um, the, um, the continued discussion or theme has been um, mindset, tactics, skill, and gear. And uh, that is, uh, that's what we've all been functioning with. And this is not just firearms training. This is not just medical, and it's not just preparatory. So if we, um, <clears throat> if we look at um, how much we like to train with boomsticks and hand cannons, and how much we like our gear, um, gear's awesome. In fact, it's why I continue to host classes um, <clears throat> because you get to see all the new stuff come out and you don't have to buy it, you know. You get to pick what you want after you go Google over it, everything. Uh, the sound of uh, metal going through Kydex makes me shiver. Um, and uh, there's nothing like a, <clears throat> a uniformed uh, multicam fella uh, taking, the, taking the class. What, but uh, seriously, uh, that's not why I was into it. So we talk about extremes. Uh, medical planning. Do you have a medical plan? Well, that sounds extreme. I just need a Band-Aid. Well, okay. Extreme. I went to the Extreme Medical Expo Conference at Harvard University uh, in 2013. Go Red Sox, uh, over the same period of time that uh, they won the World Series. And um, it was extreme. <coughs> I came back to a uh, small town, <clears throat> West Texas, and was told, why would you worry about stuff like that? You're not gonna split anything with a banana leaf here, you know? And it's like, hmm, you're not thinking outside the box. You're not giving yourself an opportunity to grow and you're not thinking beyond your day-to-day -day everything space. Because um, that is, that, uh, to me, that's the hindrance of a lot of folks. So the mention of uh, SHTF um, is, is uh, extreme to some people. But is it really? Because wherever I go, shit's happening. <laughs> Whether it's happening to me or somebody else, um, it just happens. And um, that is obviously the extreme in how we think of it and talk about it on the internet and everywhere else. But why, are, why don't we think in that mentality? Why don't we think of that in our day-to-day, -day, in our medical care on a daily basis? Why don't we think about that continuum of care? Because if I want to teach about mindset, tactics, gear, and skill, then I need to know something about that. And I want to be able to know beyond or at least have an idea beyond of what the next level is because you're always seeking more and you need to do that in medical as well so beyond your personal carry do you think about the long-term plan do you think about that at all james nope no okay so maybe that's something that you need to think about so <coughs> what happens when you use that stuff what's the next step you need to replace it yeah oh, yeah you need to replace it and that's the bad thing it goes back to gear it's why we think it's fun and shiny and it's like, man, I don't want to take it out of the package. It's awesome and I can take it and fondle with it and it's, it's fantastic, but I'm not going to use it because it's, you know, it's there. It's in the vacuum pack. It's like when I was a little kid, we'd get our school supplies. Man, I'd sharpen my pencils. I'd count my crayons. It was great. Didn't help me do math, but I knew all my gear was there, right? <laughs> Same thing, right? Same thing with medical. So if we're not taking the time and, and discipline <coughs> ourselves and saying, you know what, as a group, because I'm a tight ass, Let's all get together and let's pitch in. Let's have some practice stuff. And let's get that tribe together and make sure that we function and put that H bandage on. We can function with that tourniquet. So TQ, no coincidence there, just so you know. 
well, there's a little. So, um, tourniquets. Those things are awesome. If you never get them out of the package, you never try to use them. You never try to use them in a high stress situation. You never try to do it in the 30 second commercial in between uh, whatever you're watching on TV. I was going to give an example, but I want to embarrass Steve. But uh, <clears throat> have you guys thought about long term as far as um, medications that you carry? or would need in a situation where you're gone for three weeks. Let's say you're traveling to train somebody. Um, what are you carrying? Are you carrying for you? Are you carrying for your group? Are you carrying for your tribe? Are you carrying for your students? Over-the-counter medications, prescription medications. Have you thought about that? Have you made your list? Have you put it together? <coughs> Is it a valid thing to think about? You carry an extra gun in case something breaks down, right? You know, body breaks down, things happen. Um, your buddies break down, things happen. So, um, the, uh, the um, other thing to think about is, I, I really think there's only three things that come into an ER. And um, one of them is staples and stitches. One of them is tummy traumas. And the other one is uh, bad choices with the lack of prevention and safety, okay? And that last one's a big category. It's where us marshmallow uh, skill set folks come in sometimes. Um, but it's also when we don't function and train correctly, where we end up with um, gunshot wounds and problems in an accident situation, obviously not a fight. So we go back to the shit hits the fan, right? <clears throat> shit hits the fan is beans, bullets, and band-aids. So we like the bullet part, we like the gear part, or, and we're willing, a lot of us are willing, which is great, to, um, to train and be prepared in that aspect. Beans, I'm doing a prophylactic kind of thing but <clears throat> anyway um <coughs> band-aids you need to go beyond just band-aids go beyond getting that kit and being so proud of it um and not getting that second kit and um functioning with it that's a big deal so um think about uh immediate action medical think about being able to triage because more than one person is might be the situation especially in today's age and think about the continuum of care um, of that patient because that tourniquet that you put on doesn't come off to that trauma surgeon gets in there. What you do in your rapid response immediately affects the, that patient to the end result, okay, until resolution. And then you got rehab. That's a whole other story. We won't deal with that. Think about being isolated and knowing where your resources are and, and what how to get there. Does anybody know where the hospital is here in Camden? Who knows? Right over there. Right over there? One, two, how many people know? Okay, great. So that's a big deal. It's part of it, right? Knowing where your resources are. Um, anybody know the helicopter number for this area in case you need it? 911. 911. That's fantastic. It's a hell of a start, right? Uh, you can't go beyond that, buddy. I, I, I got it. To go back to, to wanting to take it out of that package, I tell you what, there's a funny story. I'll bore you just a second. I was standing outside uh, talking to an employee, an EMT, and um, we we're discussing life uh, because sometimes life happens. A young lady walks by, she was not young at all, um, probably in her 70s. <clears throat> she has a sling on one arm and she's got two dogs on the other. Big dog, little dog, okay? And she's walking like this. And there's a cat that kind of hangs out at my house. He might get fed there, but he's not my cat. Um, but Anyway, it's not my cat, and the end of the story is damn sure not my cat. Anyway, the cat walked by the dog, and um, the dog took off. Poor little lady, boom! And you could hear the skin split to skull right there on the concrete, and it went from eyebrow to hairline. It was beautiful, beautiful act. Um, <clears throat> immediately, I said, I'll grab something. EMT does what EMTs do best, apply pressure, kind of like, hmm. Well, this is interesting. What are we going to do now? I opened up the back of my car and I had multiple gunshot wound kits, multiple blowout kits. I had multiple parts of blowout kits. I had all kinds of stuff. I didn't want to open any of that up. I thought, that shit's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, um, I happened to have an OB kit there and um, <clears throat> the uh, post hemorrhage pad was there. And so I applied a vaginal recovery device to her head and uh, curlexed it with bright orange uh, curlex. And uh, then we went from there, called uh, the appropriate people and got her to the appropriate place. 
I just wanted to see the look on the face of the nurse that took that off because she would know exactly what it was. Um, but yeah, so that's an example of, you know, did, did she need that stuff? No. But the thing went through my head. I, I'm not opening this stuff. This is my cool dude shit, you know? Um, but did I have something I could have used? Sure. Uh, it was just kind of funny that I would use a, a pad. Um, anyway, funny stuff. So anyway, in your circle, in your tribe, um, bullets, band-aids, beans, and uh, shit tickets, make sure you got them. Uh, make sure you know how to use them, um, shit tickets included. You need to seek out the people um, and go beyond beans, bullets, and band-aids. Um, think long-term, think the continuum of care. Think about how important it is for you to act immediately, respond with the appropriate things, and know that what you've done is going to affect that patient um, to the end, because at that point, they're your patient, okay? Make sense? So in closing, hopefully I've inspired or rekindled some people's um, mindset and directive in um, <coughs> learning to discipline yourself, even though you don't want to. Open that package, you know, buy two of everything and make sure that you can uh, function with the equipment. Make sure your people can function with the equipment for you. Uh, drill, practice, train. Uh, you know, you're training for the fight. You need to train beyond the fight as well. So thank you very much. I um, want to introduce uh, Joe Jenkins. He's going to talk about the warrior mindset in our everyday lives. Good morning. How is everybody today? Good. 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 All right. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Those out in YouTube land, uh, good morning to you as well. All right, so uh, the warrior mindset in our everyday lives. Bear with me here a minute. Um, so... A lot of speeches this morning. I know everybody, this is over, over discussed, but mindset, everybody talks about it. Um, but we're going to have another one. So, uh, before we get started, public service announcement. Um, there are going to be some stories in here that are slightly risque. Uh, sometime during my time in front of you, um, you're going to learn about my, uh, um, how should I say this, uh, how I used to get paid to fondle breasts. Uh, so, I know what you're thinking, all you guys out there. Uh, man, I'm jealous. Yes, you are. And why in the hell did he ever quit that job? We'll get to that later. So uh, the warrior mindset, we have to break it down. Right? We've all heard of the fighting mindset. We've all heard of fighting. Great presentation on it earlier. Right? So let's break that down. Where I like to get started with it <clears throat> is the principles of personal defense. Everybody that's here has read this, and if you have not yet, you are wrong. Go get this book, read it. It will change your life. Uh, best way to describe it is in the forward. Principles of Personal Defense is the fighting man's guide to mental conditioning, plain and simple. And there is no better work on the subject. All right, so brief glimpse into the contents of this book for those of you that have not read it. Because we're going to break down the fighting mindset away from the worry mindset, <sighs> alertness. Somebody out there give me a definition for alertness. Paying attention. Paying attention, all right. Uh, decisiveness, same thing. Ability. Somebody, not everybody at once. Ability to make a decision. Yeah, yeah. Quickly. Quickly, exactly, all right, we got that. Uh, aggressiveness, same thing, come on guys, speak up. Acting quickly? Acting quickly in what matter? Uh, of course, way. Oh, yeah. There we go. We'll go with that. Um, speed. We all know what that is. Just do shit quick. All right? Coolness. Staying, Staying calm. calm. Staying calm. All right. Ruthlessness. Determination. In violence. <laughs> Doing things that... Uh, Willing to do what the other guy will. There you go. That is great, 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 great. And surprise. Surprise! Right? <laughs> Do things that aren't expected. Um, so this is great for fighting. It's something that you should have ingrained in your head. This should be part of your mindset. But as far as everyday life, uh, how does that translate? Um, all right, ruthless surprise, right? Do things in your business that people aren't expecting and may be questionable to some, but will propel you further. But how might not that translate so much so to other parts of your everyday life? 
Anybody got any examples? Nobody? All right, I'll give you one. All right, so uh, ruthless surprise. You're putting your daughter to bed at night. She said, Daddy, the boogeyman's in the closet. And I can't fall asleep. Oh, honey, you don't have to worry about the boogeyman. He's right here. That's not going to go so well. You don't want to use that here. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Don't be a sociopath, right? All right, so fighting mindset, great thing to have in your mindset. If I can spell. All right, um, but we're going to work into the warrior mindset. So what can we add to that to help us every day of our lives? All right, first one, self-discipline. Somebody give me a definition. Holding yourself accountable. Holding yourself accountable, it's great. Um, controlling your feelings and overcoming your weaknesses uh, or to pursue what you think is right despite of wanting to abandon it. Now, kind of self-obvious, but let's delve into it anyway. Uh, why might this be important? Wake up every morning, eh, I know I need to go to work today, but I don't feel like it. I'll just call out. You ain't gonna have that job very long. <laughs> you can't support your family. You can't do the things in life that you're really should be doing to take care of those that you have in your inner circle. Uh, <clears throat> after that, one of my core values, integrity. What does that mean to somebody that I haven't heard from yet? Being honest with yourself when nobody's watching. All right, being honest with yourself when nobody's watching. Um, that's great. I would go so far as to extend that as not only being honest with yourself, but honest with everybody, which if you're honest with yourself, you will be honest with everybody, when nobody's <coughs> watching, doing the right thing. doesn't matter how much I'm going to benefit from, uh, oops, somebody left the bank vault open and everybody, everybody's not there. They, they, they left their shit open and I could be a millionaire, but that's not the right thing to do. It just isn't. Just don't think about it. Do the right thing. <clears throat> uh, mental toughness. Somebody you haven't heard from yet? Not everybody at once. Willing to go the extra mile in um, the absence of orders. Willing to go the extra mile in the absence of orders. Um, that's great. Um, an army guy would tell me that. A non-typical army guy would tell me that, the absence of orders. Love it. Um, uh, not letting things that happen in your life bother you. And like, oh, I got a flat tire. That's okay. Change it back to work, right? Um, answering all the problems in your life with the word uh, good. For those of you that listen to the Jocko podcast, oh, no, I didn't get the job. Good. Find the positive in it. Helps you stay tough in your mind. Right? Uh, more so on that, we'll get into it. Determination. Somebody else? Not willing to quit. Not willing to quit. Uh, that's a great one. Crosses over into another point we're going to get to. Um, I'll just go right into the story about it, right? So, uh, my first job I ever had working on a farm, um, it was a dairy farm, so. <coughs> Maybe I kind of didn't get paid to fondle breasts, it was more squeezing teats, um, but uh, semantics, you know, whatever. <laughs> Everybody has their perspective, don't judge. Um, one of the first professions in our society was farming. Right there, how many people on this earth today? Seven billion, Seven billion probably more at this point. Um, we would not be here if it wasn't for farmers. Has anybody in here ever farmed before? Like, oh yeah, our homesteader, right? right? <laughs> Did you have to have any amounts of determination when you were homesteading at all? Just a every, smidgen? Every day. Every day, so if you weren't determined to do everything you needed to do 
you could starve to death, you could freeze to death, whole thing would the whole thing would fall apart. So without determination, that's exactly it. Um, specifically for a dairy farm, the whole thing falling apart. If you're not determined to wake up at 3.30 in the morning every day, get to the, run the cows in, get to the parlor, start doing your work. Not only do you let the people on the farm down, you let the people for, uh, <coughs> um, uh, in the milk industry down, you let the people that want to eat cereal down, you let everybody in society down that revolves around dairy. You don't think about that, but it's a bigger picture. You have to be determined. <coughs> so, um, that brings us to our ancient Chinese proverb, right? Confucianism, not really. Uh, but anyway, uh, one learns quickly the shitty lesson, never yawn around cows with loose bowels. All right, um, yeah, Ugh. it's just like inhaling dirty water or something. It's, you just, that's the reason I quit the fondling breast job um, for those that were wondering. So uh, to get on with it, courage. I'm going to give you a definition. What it means to you. The will to act in adversity. The willing to act in adversity. That is perfect. So, uh, um, against something that you fear. So, um, for those of you on YouTube land, I know everybody here might not relate so much to, but a, a modern society gesture of this might be, um, let's say, uh, winning a, a bunch, winning, winning some Olympic medals, and then decades later, becoming a woman. Uh, you may or may not agree with that. Doesn't really make a difference. Uh, the, the Olympic part, definitely the courageous part. Going against everybody else in the world, you have to have courage to do that. So credit where credit's due. Another one of my favorites. Persistence. Definition? Somebody? Continuing on. Continuing on. That's great. Somebody else? Continuing despite setbacks. Continuing despite setbacks. Somebody else. It's, these are all great. Staying, staying in the fight. Staying in the fight. There you go. That's that's a great one. Staying in the fight, no matter what. Yeah. You can do all these things. You can get into a fight, but if you don't have this, the worst can happen. And not just in the fight, but everywhere in your life. Uh, I lost my job. You know, got to keep going. Got to keep pushing forward. I lost my significant other. Got to keep going. Got to keep pushing forward. Quitting <coughs> does not exist in your vocabulary when you have this in your warrior mindset. Um, my background's a mechanic. Uh, I went to tech school here in Nashville, Tennessee, back before Lincoln Tech it was Lincoln Tech. It was Nashville Auto Diesel College. And, uh, my job that I had to help put me through that, I worked, um, my, I would wake up every day and I'd go to work and I'd make things black, round, and hard. All right, now get it out of your mind. Now, no, I wasn't a fluffer, all right? I worked in a tire shop. I guess that's kind of like the fluffing industry for mechanics, but regardless. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my boss that I had there, um, and I would go so far to say as he wasn't really a boss, he was a leader. His life mantra was endeavor to persevere. Life gets you down, just endeavor to persevere. Doesn't matter what happens, endeavor to persevere. Stuck with me this long, might as well be useful, right? So, uh, I mentioned that he was not just a boss, he was a leader. Leadership. If you're gonna be a warrior, you need to be a leader. Somebody give me a definition for leadership. Someone that can inspire, motivate, and make decisions. Could be relatively couldn't be said better. Somebody that can inspire, motivate, and make decisions, right? You have to be able to inspire those that are looking up to you. You have to be able to motivate them. You have to find ways to do that when you're thinking, I don't know how to communicate with this person. Persevere to be a good leader. Big one. We're going to continue this over here. Open-minded. 
What does that mean to you? Willing to learn at every opportunity. Willing to learn at every opportunity. Uh, that's perfect, right? Uh, constantly thinking. You're always getting more input. Right now, you're getting more input. Right now, I'm getting more input. Constantly thinking. More importantly, I would say critically thinking. This is something that has been out of the syllabus of most public schools. Those of you that are in high school, middle school, wherever, or out of it, learn to critical think, make your own decisions, get things in your head, and think about what you're told from those around you, above you, in the media, any input you're getting in your life. Critically think. And it doesn't mean that I came to this conclusion, so I'm done with it. Any scientist, any true scientist out there can tell you means uh, we know the theory of relativity. But because we know it, we can critically think about it always and keep coming back to the same conclusion, right? And now, uh, the last one in this list, because if you're open-minded, you're going to be constantly rethinking this. And we're all here. This goes, this is in all aspects of your life, <clears throat> including the brotherhood that we have here at Tactical Response. I encourage you to come become part of it. No homo, guys, but it is love. Somebody name me the number one selling book in the world in all of history. Harry Potter. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually wasn't Harry Potter, it was Fifty Shades of Grey. No, it was the Bible, all right? Now, regardless of what your theology is or any of that, uh, the overall prevailing message was love. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and don't think about yourself while you're doing it. Selflessness, it goes along with love, right? So, was Jesus a fighter? Absolutely. Absolutely, but he didn't fight with these. He fought with this. He was a warrior, right? He died for his people. Is that all he did? No. He lived for his people. That's what this is. Any schmuck can die for somebody else. You can die for your daughter. You can be the laziest piece of shit that ever lived, not be an influential member, and die for her. But can you live for those that you love? That also could include dying for them. You're living for them in that moment to die for them and save them. Would you live for somebody to save them or die for them to save them? That's living for somebody else. So with that, we've covered all the aspects of a fighting mindset and those things to add to it to get you to a warrior mindset. I encourage you to be open-minded about this moving forward in the future. Constantly revisit this, constantly think about it critically. And above all, be a fighter, be a lover, and in both of those, be a warrior. Because if it was not for love, what would we do anything for at all? Thank you. I would like to invite <clears throat> James, who is going to be talking about why a CCW class is not enough. Okay. Greetings, fellow instructor candidates. And hello to YouTube. YouTube, if I had known you would be watching, I probably would not have signed up for the class. <laughs> <laughs> but be that as it may, I would like to talk about how I became a concealed carrier and why that class is not enough and what to do about it. Now, I will be speaking in reference to the state of New Mexico, my home state. But I'm sure this translates to all the other states also. About, uh, yeah, about a year and a, a year ago, a little over a year ago, I decided I would become a concealed carrier. So I sought a class 
and I found one in the community college catalog and signed up. The class consisted of 15 hours of instruction, 12 hours of lecture, and three hours on the range. And then the uh, three hours on the range was your, uh, you actually shot a, a gun to demonstrate that you were competent enough to be trusted to carry concealed. So the instructor hung up a target. It was a white sheet of paper, 18 inches by 24 inches. No bullseye, no other markings. Just a white sheet of paper, 18 inches by 24 inches. Then at three yards, I had to fire 15 rounds. Then at seven yards, I had to fire 10 rounds. And anywhere the bullet impacted on that 18 by 24 piece of paper was good. They didn't have to be grouped, they just had to hit the paper. And the way the, the concealed carry law is written, you carry the gun that you qualified with. In other words, if you qualified with nine millimeter, then all you could carry would be nine millimeter or a lesser caliber than that. So I shot the course when my, the instructor is 1911. And it was a pretty good 1911. It fired all 25 rounds with no malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> so I was quite impressed. And then the uh, instructor gave this uh, discourse about how Glocks are the most dangerous pistol ever made, but that's outside the purview of this. And also, you, if you were going to carry a revolver, you had to qualify with a revolver. So I fired another uh, 25 rounds with a Ruger Security 6 and 357. Uh, just because it was available, I wanted to get my money's worth out of the class. So with that, by firing 50 rounds of ammunition at a uh, standing in front of an 18 inch by 24 inch piece of paper, I was then qualified by the state of New Mexico to carry a concealed weapon. So, it felt kind of weird to me though. It was kind of like the first time I had sex. Was that it? <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I was expecting more. <laughs> uh, so, I was still not comfortable carrying a concealed weapon. I was not confident. I was not comforted by my weapon. I was actually nervous and, and jittery. I was very afraid to carry because the class had not really expanded my knowledge of weaponry, of how to handle a weapon, or what to do in a self-defense encounter. So, I got on the good old internet and Googled firearms training, and long story short, ended up here a tactical response. Uh, I was here for the trifecta the same month that I got my uh, concealed carry permit. Now, all of you who have been to, to the trifecta, or just the, the fight class by itself, you know that afterward, your mind just spins. It just keeps spinning, going over those scenarios and what I could have done, what I should have done, and ooh, I'm not gonna do that again. So it occur occurred to me that maybe people should have that level of training as a minimum to be issued a permit. So I did a little research and I thought maybe there should be a law that would raise the uh, level of competency before issuing a permit. So I researched the history of the uh, concealed carry permit in New Mexico. Well, it turns out that in 2003, New Mexico became a shall issue state. Good thing. But for that to take place, there was a tremendous <coughs> controversy 
You know, the good people wanted to get a shall issue state, and the hoplophobes did not. Hoplophobe is a term that was coined by Colonel Jeff Cooper in 1962. He took the word hoplos, which is Greek for weapon or armament, and he combined it with the Greek phobos, which means fear. So a hoplophobe is someone who has an unreasonable fear of weapons, especially handguns. So you all know how a state legislature works. Someone introduces a bill, and then there's discussion and debate, and one side concedes this part, and the other side will agree to this part. So whatever the law started up out here, it filters down through all the debate and concessions, and you end up with this watered-down piece of legislature. So I was going to say a piece of something else, didn't you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, so, the law itself is really quirky. According to the law, I cannot carry my concealed weapon on any school campus, grade school, high school, or college. However, and it actually says this, if I'm on horseback, I can carry a weapon sealed, concealed or openly as long as I'm on the horse. I can ride across the campus on a horse and carry my weapon. It's an extension of the concept that uh, your, your castle extends to your vehicle. And in New Mexico, horses are considered vehicles for, for the concealed carry law anyway. Yeah. So I thought about that and I thought, well, Would, would it work to have a, a more stringent law to uh, bring up the level of competency for people who want to carry a weapon? And see, so the answer to that is no. Because a permit is a license, and all licenses any license that, that is issued demonstrates only one thing. And that says that you have demonstrated an absolute minimum competency for whatever the activity the license covers. Driver's license. You have demonstrated an absolute minimum competency to operate an automobile. It does not make you an expert driver. It does not make you a safe driver. So a tougher licensing law would, would not do it. And besides, if you pass a tougher law requiring higher standards, you would end up at a fighting pistol class with a Bubba standing next to you. You guys all know Bubba. Bubba's the guy that carries a 1911 because a 45 will stop anything with the first shot. And he can also, at 10 yards, keep eight, eight shots in the middle of a paper plate. So he's good. <laughs> and then there's his wife, Baba Ann, <laughs> who's carrying a 38 special revolver because she's too weak to uh, rock the slide on a pistol. So, if you're in class with Bubba, what's going to happen? Bubba's not going to be open-minded. He's not going to co cooperate with the uh, instructor, but it's going to take time away from your instruction. It's the same as that old saying, never <clears throat> teach a pig to sing. Because it's a waste of your time, and it annoys the pig. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the answer? How, how do we get people to get more training that's required by the permit? Well, it comes down, you have to depend on the moral character of each individual permit holder. 
Now, here's why I say moral character. Moral is defined as being concerned with principles of right and wrong behavior and the goodness or badness of human character. The ultimate example of wrong behavior is incompetently discharging a firearm in a public place. Now, the, the other side of that, the great example of right behavior is competently firing a pistol in a public place to take out an active killer. And, it, and if you are willing to take out an active killer, that speaks to your goodness of human character. All of you here are moral people. I know that because you're in this class. So what we need to do is just encourage all those people that come to us for advice about what kind of gun to buy, how to learn to use it, where do I go shooting. You need to uh, encourage them, by your example, <coughs> to seek out better training. And as for the Bubba's, we'll just have to let Darwinian selection take care of them. And now I'd like to introduce Yan, who's going to uh, talk to us about EDC. Thank you, James. Good morning. Morning, YouTube. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we all know the four things that we need for self-defense, right? Mindset tactics, skill, and gear. Well, I'm going to talk about the uh, part that nobody ever talks about uh, on YouTube or in real life. They all focus about the other stuff. I focus about gear because it's the fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to start with uh, showing you what I carry on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, how, I, how I thought about it and the reasons why and all that stuff. So um, I'm going to start around my belt right here. So I, care, I use a SOE belt with a Cobra buckle, and right in the middle, I uh, carry a uh, TDR or TDI uh, uh, knife with a uh, NSR sheath. Um, then uh, I go around. I've got a, a Glock 19 with uh, big dot sights, uh, Surefire 300 Ultra on it, uh, also NSR holster. Uh, you could carry any gun you want, uh, that's not important, um, just as long as it's a Glock 19. Other than that, you're wrong, <laughs> so carry what you want. Keep going around, I got nothing else on my belt, so I go to my pockets, and uh, right front pocket, I've got my phone, and then I carry two flashlights. I got a Surefire backup, just for looking around, seeing uh, if I lose my keys or anything like that, just to look around. And then I carry the Surefire Tactician for actual tactical stuff. It's really bright. Uh, I, I don't use it to save the battery. I just, when I want to look, look for something, I use that one. Um, that's in my front right pocket. I go around, got nothing in the back pockets, and I go to my left front pocket. I got a spare magazine, <coughs> Glock 17. This one's carrying HST rounds. Uh, if I'm gonna do a reload, might as well be a uh, higher capacity and then I carry my keys. I carry my keys with this key bar right here. Uh, it holds all my keys, it's great, because they don't jiggle, and they're always in the same place. They kind of, it's a nice little cube when they're all folded up. Got all my basic keys in here. Uh, only key I don't have in here is my motorcycle key, and I don't want to put that in there because it would stick too far out uh, on the side of the engine block. Uh, but everything else is right here, just folds in and out. Great little system. Love it. I've been using that for about two years. It's awesome. Um, and then my cargo pockets. Right side, I got my wallet. And left side, I've got this uh, pocket box. So, box stands for ventilated operator kit. This one holds uh, compressed gauze, TK4, uh, a needle for decompression, duct tape, and some gloves. So, basically, everything other than the uh, nasal pharyngeal and the H uh, bandage. 
that you would find in the complete VOC for from tactical response, which is great. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So that's what I carry on my person all the time. Now what I have with me as well is uh, in my truck, I should say. So when I go in and out of the house, I put this in the back seat of my truck or right behind my, my seat. Uh, it's a small little sling bag made by Max Maxpedition. Um, I like it because it's small and when you wear it, so I've got access to uh, the first tourniquet right here and then I could just flip it over my shoulder and now I've got access to everything right in front of me. All the zippers are up here. I've got two additional tourniquets there and then two right here that I can quick access to. And if you look at the front of it, it's got all the pockets, like I said, the zippers on top. So I've got my gloves right on top. And then the, the, the secondary pocket here, I've got all the uh, NPAs here with some gel. Second pocket, i got some glow sticks duct tape and everything else. Glow sticks is if it happens at night, I can uh, put it near us so it kind of glows around us without using a flashlight or I can identify rooms that I've been through already if it's really dark. Got my shears on top. This is a whole other VOC right here that I can access and like just strip out and give to somebody else if there's uh, somebody helping me. And then the main compartment, take the zippers here. So. What I've got is like all the bulk of the medical kit. So start at one end. I've got a whole bunch of uh, H bandage and the other kind here, the uh, Olis. Uh, I like these two. They're, they're both just as good. Um, I don't have a preference over uh, one or the other. Got uh, rolled gauze. I got the four inch, uh, four inch uh, squares, depending on the size of the wound, what I can pack or just tape over. I also have some uh, sea locks uh, for gunshot wounds. It's like a syringe. You put it, you put it in the wound, and then you take the plunger that's right next to it, and you insert it. You get get in there deep, and then if you still need to pack, you go over that. Um, that's about it for that main compartment. So I can plug and seal anything that I need to, and then on the back side, uh, where I believe is where they want you to put the bladder on this bag, I carry uh, six packs of these double chest seals. So basically every pack, you've got two real chest seals in there and then you could take the, the, the packaging with duct tape and make a third one. So having six in here, I've got 18 possible chest seals. So that's quite a bit and it doesn't take any space. It's like paper thin, so it doesn't really take any room. Um, the other reason I love setting it up like this is if I'm doing something on the ground, I don't have to take a backpack off, you know, dig through it and fix something. If I have to move quickly, I could just get up, it's with me, and I could just keep on moving. So it's really awesome for that. And then uh, every backpack or sling bag that I have has a spare magazine, a uh, rifle mag. Um, and I'm gonna show you another, uh, just keep this in mind for now. I'll show you why a little later. So that's when I'm in my truck or at work or whatever, when I've got a way to carry that. When I uh, ride my motorcycle, I can't put that in any of my saddlebags. I can carry it on my back, but I've got, if I've got a passenger, that doesn't work out either. So what I have in one of the saddlebags is just this pouch here, SOE pouch, it's got Velcro on the back. So if you've got another backpack that's got it, you could attach it to it. So what I've got in it is another one of these Vox here, right there, um, plus, uh, a cat tourniquet, a pair of shears, and uh, what else do I have in here? And, and an extra uh, H bandage. So two H bandages, two tourniquets, uh, and the rest of that stuff with gloves and a pair of shears. So I could put that in a saddle bag. So I've got this all the time in my uh, on my motorcycle, plus that box that I showed you at the beginning that's always on my person. The reason I keep that uh, extra magazine on every bag I have is when I ride, when I drive my truck, I have this with me at all times. So this is uh, my fighting rifle. It's a 16 inch LWRC, um, love it. What I've added to it is this sling, single point sling. Most of my rifles have single point, um, other than a few except exceptions with the two point slings. Um, also has an extra tourniquet. You, gotta, you can't have too many of those. 
We'll start at the front here. I've got a Surefire uh, flash hider. It's a QD mount for a Surefire uh, uh, silencer. I've got a uh, Surefire M600, really bright light. It's on my left side right now uh, because I don't have the new tail cap and du dual switch uh, that I need to mount on this rifle. When I do get those, it'll be switched over to that side with the dual switch on top. Tech 15 for night vision stuff. I got the, this is my first Trigicon MRO. Uh, I like it so far. I've always used T1s or T2s from Aimpoint. This has been great. I just, I'm testing it out. It's got good, good reviews from some friends that have used them uh, pretty uh, intensely. We'll see how far it goes. If not, I'll go back to Aimpoint. I've got uh, backup sights from LWRC. And then I carry two mags. Uh, that way, if I just grab this, at least I've got two mags ready to go. That's why I kind of put that third one there, but at least I've got two. What I put in it is Hornady uh, tap ammo at 75 grain bullets. Uh, great rounds, really accurate, hits hard at distance. That's about it on the rifle that I could think of. Um, this is just the LWRC stock that came with it. Uh, I like it, it's small enough when you collapse it. I put it on the second position. Um, that's about it on that. Do I have any questions? No? Do you keep any medical with your rifle? I just have this with the rifle and then the bag or something like that is what I keep with the rifle at all times. If I've got the rifle, I definitely have that bag with me. All right, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Grant. He's going to be talking to us about deliberate practices. So I will let Grant take the stage. Hey guys, how's everybody doing this morning? Great, good morning man. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for those of you out on YouTube watching. So my name is Grant, I'm a law enforcement instructor for several agencies in Central Missouri and I own a small business and give away free CCW classes to kind of spread the message that we're all here for. So I'd like everybody to think of their favorite instructor. Once you thought of your instructor, I'd like you to imagine that this person was paralyzed from the neck down. This is kind of odd, but bear with me. Uh, it doesn't matter why. Maybe if your favorite instructor is your shotgun instructor, it's because of some sort of really potent venereal disease or a small aircraft collision. doesn't matter. <laughs> Is this instructor still capable of imparting the information to you that's valuable to you? Why are they why they're your favorite instructor? Paralyzed from the neck down, are they still your favorite instructor? Could you continue to learn from them? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So what makes a good instructor? Well, I think it's defining the difference between competency and proficiency. Can anybody kind of flesh that out for me? What's the difference between competency and proficiency? Yeah, uh, competency is how much of the subject matter they know and how well they know it, and then proficiency is how well they're able to actually you, like perform that. That is the perfect definition of the contrast between those two terms. Proficiency is their overall understanding, the depth of their knowledge about a certain topic, whereas proficiency is their ability to execute and perform that task. Okay, so... If we want a really, really good instructor, do we want proficiency or competency? Competency. We want competency. Not only is their understanding of the topic at hand much more in depth, but they're also able to impart that knowledge to a student considerably better than somebody who's just capable of performing the act itself. So some other elements of a good instructor uh, are the fact that they offer courses that align with the stuff that we want to learn. Uh, and that they're professional. Now, what does professional mean? It's kind of hard to define what certain accolades or accreditations mean, but professional is just that they are exchanging services to consumers. So it's their occupation to provide this information and teach students. You know, it's not just my buddy. Well, I'm getting instruction from my friend because he's a cop. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Trust me. Manner of handling a weapon or inside of a building or something like that. They don't want you taking a weapon out and manipulating it. So I'm on the range at tactical response, taking fighting pistol and 
In spite of the fact that I was trained and explicitly told by instructors not to do this, I popped a magazine out of my handgun and was reloading it over at the bench. And an instructor saw this, and like a good instructor, he came up and said, Hey man, why are you doing that? You weren't taught to do that. Well, this is how I was shown to do it by my police academy, and uh, this is just kind of the way I do things. And he said, Okay, and just walked off. Uh, this instructor didn't speak to me for the rest of the weekend, and I don't blame him. So, can anybody point out a few things that I might have done wrong as a student? Close-mindedness. Close That's a good one. Not following instructions. Yeah, I wasn't following the instructor's teachings. Anything else? To pay money to tell somebody else what you do. Yeah, exactly. Can anybody think of an adjective? Like asshole? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that guy. <laughs> so to be a good student, you need to have several things going for you. One is having an open mind. Why in the hell would you pay somebody else to tell them how you shoot? That doesn't make any sense. We need to check our ego before we get to class. Actually, that's the number one thing that prevents people from seeking training, specifically at a place like this, is their ego gets in the way. They're scared shitless of confronting their mortality, of allowing their peers to see what they're capable of, or not capable of. So checking your ego, having an open mind. You gotta make sure you're training for the right reasons. Like am I here just to get a certificate? Like so I can put it on the wall in my office and be like, check this out. I don't touch doors blocks, suckers. <laughs> no, I'm actually here to learn something. I'm here to become a better fighter, a better student, a better warrior, and a better person. I want to be familiar with the course material before I arrive. Meaning that I understand why I'm there, what I'm going to learn, and what I need to bring. And on that same topic, the stuff that I bring needs to be quality. I need to eliminate as many variables as possible for things going wrong. For instance, if I bring crummy ammunition and a shitty gun and my belt's falling apart, the instructors aren't able to focus on me and what I might be doing wrong because they're too worried about getting my shit squared away. They can't worry about teaching me. I need to take notes during class and keep records so I can go back and practice what I learned later need to ask questions. Hey man, I don't get this. Not only is that beneficial to you, but there might be other students in class who are thinking the same thing and might just be too meek to raise their hand and fucking ask it. Well, I'll ask it. So we've talked about what makes a good instructor, what makes a good student. Let's define training. Training is learning what and how to practice under the watchful eye of a competent instructor. Okay. So if we're learning what and how to practice, what is practice? Practice is repeated performance of a task in order to gain proficiency. Well, if I want to maximize my gains and proficiency through practice, what kind of practice do I need to do? Anybody? Deliberate. Sure, deliberate practice. Most people will say perfect practice. You know, what kind of practice makes perfect? Perfect practice. Deliberate practice, a less known term. Mike's on top of shit, so he knows what, what deliberate practice is. Uh, deliberate practice was a term coined by doctors Anderson Erickson, or excuse me, Anders Erickson and Malcolm Gladwell when they published a book together called Outliers. In this book, uh, Malcolm Gladwell can insists that 10,000 repetitions of anything will gain you a certain mastery or proficiency with any task. But uh, his cohort, Dr. Erickson disagreed with this, so they went their separate ways, and then Dr. Erickson, Erickson published a book called Peak. And he said, no, 10,000 repetitions is just some arbitrary number. You can't assign a number like that to something to, to determine mastery. He said to create neural pathways, you can't just do 10,000 repetitions of something however the hell you want. You have to do them very deliberately. Now, let's define deliberate practice. So to do that, we need to break it into principles. One of these principles is we practice with clear objectives in mind. I know exactly what I want to work on, exactly what proficiencies that I want to improve in. And then I'm going to break down these proficiencies into elements. So for instance, like a draw stroke. What's the first element of a draw stroke? A clear concealment. Yeah, like clearing a concealed garment. That's a perfect example. Lateral movement, getting this stuff down. Getting a good grip, firing grip on the handgun before it's removed from the holster. You know, <clears throat> drawing proficiently involves efficient movements. 
Okay, so I've got these elements in mind that I know that I need to work on trying to improve my draw stroke. Another element of or principle of deliberate practice is extreme focus while practicing. And this is actually the key here. It's almost a meditative act to, to have such extreme focus during practice. Uh, we want to plan our deliberate practice before we go to the range. Everybody knows that guy that like shows up to the range and it's just blowing ammo, you know, and sometimes that guy's us. It's cool. <laughs> but if we don't have a, a goal in mind, we haven't broken down uh, the tasks that we're trying to improve into specific elements. We don't plan what we're doing before we get there. We're not going to improve as, as much as we, we have the potential to. And one of the other most important concepts of deliberate practice is practicing at every opportunity. So when I get home, I lock all the doors, I'm getting ready to go into condition white and just chill out. And I take my gun off for the evening. Am I just going to unsnap my holster and set it in the safe? No. No, I'm going to do a perfect draw stroke. I want to practice at every opportunity I get. That's part of martial gun handling, okay? So if I need to make my gun dangerous for whatever reason, maybe I just cleaned it, you know? How am I going to handle my gun to put a magazine in it and charge it up? The same way I handle my gun every single time I charge it up. I'm going to hold up my workspace, index my magazine correctly, practice at every opportunity. So we talked about the mental focus required for deliberate practice. Let's get a little bit more in depth with that. Each repetition is going to require so much focus that the times and round counts of your practices, they're going to decrease because it's impossible to stay focused for that long. Uh, it's going to cause mental fatigue being as focused as you are on doing everything correctly. So for instance, I just took my first starting strength class. I've been lifting most of my life. Uh, but I'd never had a coach watch me to make sure I was doing everything correctly. So I had a, a starting strength coach watch me lift, and I noticed that focusing on having the correct technique with extreme focus every time I did a repetition caused me to fatigue much faster. Now I know I'm working those muscle groups, isolating the correct muscle groups, activating the correct chains uh, a lot better. I'm getting stronger, my form's getting better, and it's safer. But I could do a lot more reps and just you know, let my technique suffer, but I'm gonna risk injury to myself and I'm not gonna improve as much in strength or in technique. So let's talk about some examples of, of this kind of deliberate practice. We already talked about the draw stroke, that's sort of a skill component. So what about a tactical component, like use of cover? So I, I know when I need to use cover that I'm gonna come right up to the edge of that cover. I'm gonna make sure I'm, I'm just right where I need to be. I'm gonna make sure I pick up the sights before I lean out. I'm going to just lean out enough to pick up maybe asshole's big toe. That's all I need. You know, maybe we're having too much fun. We just run out there and just, oh, there's the whole steel target. Start plinking away, you know. Every aspect, every element of the task we're trying to accomplish must be done perfectly. So let's talk about ways to improve mindset through deliberate practice. Every time I pick put my sights on a target, whether it's a steel target or a paper target, whatever it is, I am picturing a lethal encounter. That is an evildoer. They're trying to harm me, my family, a member of my community. This visualization is extremely important. If you don't visualize this evil person on every target you shoot, you're not doing it right. You're not training to become a better warrior. You're not practicing deliberately. Scans. Every time I scan before, you know, at the end of the Wyatt Protocol, well, not quite the end, top off. Every time I scan, I'm actually looking for cover, actively looking for more bad guys. I'm not just going through the motions. So we have to be honest with ourselves when we go out and practice. Recreational shooting is okay, guys. I mean, shit, I'll probably go out next weekend with the 1022 and blow like a whole brick of 22 down range and just have fun. Well, when I walk up to the firing line, with my concealed weapon and I'm gonna prep or my duty belt, I'm gonna practice deliberately. I'm gonna make sure that every component of everything I do is as perfect as I can get it. So guys, I talked about finding good instruction and, and how to vet a good instructor. We talked about how to be a good student and the way to get the most out of your training. We talked about practicing deliberately, having a plan, 
documenting and recording, uh, mental fatigue and focus, and how to program your training regimen to fit into those survival hierarchy components. So I would ask you guys to take stock of your proficiencies, find something that you can improve in, and plan your next trip to the range. Decide what you're going to do before you do it. I appreciate you listening today. Uh, this next speaker is a chemistry teacher in Kentucky. He's a guy who's really in his element, talking about <laughs> teachers carrying weapons, and he has a lot of solutions. His name is Stephen. <laughs> Thank you, Grant. Chemistry jokes, I love them. Uh, did you guys hear about the chemist who's reading the book on helium? No. He couldn't put it down. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Steve Davis. I'm a teacher and a firearms instructor from Kentucky, and today I'm going to be talking about how teachers should be carrying in a classroom. So, a few months ago, I was uh, getting my hair cut, and there's this lady in there, and she was talking about, oh, Trump wants to arm the teachers. This is bad. And I was like, why is this bad? I don't, I don't get it. And she's like, well, it, they don't have any experience. And I was like, well, who should be carrying weapons? And she's like, well, I don't, I don't know. And I was like, well, I've got, I carried a, a handgun for seven years when I was a combat medic in the Army. And I'm a concealed carry holder, and I've been doing that since 2004. I said, I'm also a firearms instructor. And she's like, well, somebody like you should be able to carry a gun. And I was like, I, I'm also a school teacher. And she's like, oh. So I guess she wasn't thinking that, you know, some of us aren't prepared. After the Parkland shooting, President Trump, he was all in favor of arming teachers. And I got all excited because I'm a firearms instructor and a teacher, and I thought this would be great. But then there was so much resistance. Uh, we don't need teachers armed. We need teachers to stay in the classroom with kids, and we need more school resource officers. Now, would that be an ideal solution? Yeah, yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. The more good guys with guns protecting our children, the better off we are. But what happened was they had town meetings. They sat down, politicians, school board superintendents, and sheriffs and everything, and they were like, okay, what can we do to get more school resource officers? It turned out that the sheriff, he was like, I'll put whatever officers you want where if you pay for them. And that was the thing, was money. That was the big hang-up. So, it averages about fifty to eighty-one thousand dollars a year to put a school resource officer in a school. That that's a year per officer. So, for example, um, one of the counties back home, they've got two resource officers, and they have eleven schools. So they've got nine schools without resource officers. It's going to be four hundred fifty thousand dollars at a minimum to put. A school resource officer in every school. Now, the schools have that much money. Now, a lot of schools don't have enough money to get new textbooks. So, um, I'm thinking arming teachers economically and from a safety standpoint makes sense to me. The do all teachers want to carry a handgun? We think, Mike. Do all teachers want to carry? Nope. Should all teachers carry? No. Right. I'm sure everybody in here has had a teacher before that you know is unstable and getting ready to choke the shit out of somebody. <laughs> yeah. I've had teachers like that. They, they'll sharpen a pencil, and I know somebody's getting shanked if they act up. <laughs> They're just unstable. But there are a lot of stable teachers. They did several studies, and they figured out that 80% of kindergarten through 12th grade teachers didn't want to carry a gun. But that leaves 20% who don't mind carrying guns. And within every school system, you're gonna find veterans, you're gonna find former law enforcement officers, you're gonna find former first responders with the, the mindset to do this job. And that's what I believe we need to go to. Now, another thing that's going for the schools is the gun-free zones. How well did the gun-free zone signs, how they work? Sure. You put a gun-free zone sign up, that means nobody with a gun can come in there, right? We have no worries. People act like this is a magical talisman. I put this here and nothing bad is ever going to happen because I got the sign. So again, we need to do away with that norm our teachers. Now, one opinion came out after Trump wanted to arm teachers was, 
oh my god, we can't have teachers with guns. That could be dangerous. Would arming teachers be any dangerous than an active murderer walking down the hallway killing her children? I don't think so. So, can it work? Ohio has been using the Faster Saves Lives program to train teachers up, and uh, they did 76 other 88 counties. Uh, Faster stands for Faculty Administrator Safety Training and Emergency Response. Um, it's a three-day, 26-hour class, which exceeds the Ohio's uh, Peace Officer Instruction Academy. So this program to train teachers to carry guns is more extensive than what police officers have to do in Ohio. Uh, the teachers have to do an additional course of fire where they have to shoot at moving targets and they have to score a 93% or higher on that. And since its inception, they've actually trained 10 other, or teachers from 10 other states. So it's a really good program. Now I've kind of streamlined all the factors that are involved for teachers carrying in the classroom. The first is mindset. Not everybody has the mindset needed to carry a gun in school. Not everybody has the mindset needed to actually put themselves in between the threat and our students. Training. Now, training, that's where it gets hairy. Training, concealed carry deadly weapon licenses is not enough. I'm a concealed carry instructor in Kentucky. We do a really good job at talking about the legal aspects. You can carry here, you can't carry there, you can't do this, you can't do that, and liability. But the concealed carry permit is not enough to teach people how to fight with their guns. So training's important. I, I, if I was in charge, oh God, put me in charge, please. I would, I would, I would rock this, I would rock this program. I would make everybody take a fighting pistol class like they teach here, or like here. I'd make them come down here. But I'm in charge, right? Yeah. I'm in charge of this program. They come down here and take fighting pistol. Then they take immediate action medical because they have to know how to do medical stuff. And then I would make them take the fight because everybody needs force on force. That's where you learn. And then everybody would have to take response to active shooter. So if I was in charge, that's the training I would focus on. Uh, another consideration is anonymity. The kids cannot know which teacher is carrying a handgun. It, it, it's just not going to work. They'll have to keep it concealed um, for a variety of reasons. If the students know who's carrying the gun and they tell everybody who's carrying the guns, then if an active murderer does come in, we're a target. We're, we're not really a, a force multiplier. Um, on anonymity. There was a California teacher a couple weeks after the Parkland incident. He was teaching in an elementary school. He was a reserve police officer in the city in California there. So he's in there talking to these kids, elementary school. He pulls out his piece and he desk pops one right through the ceiling in a classroom full of elementary kids. Now my first thought is, where the hell is that on the lesson plan? <laughs> okay, it's third period. I'm gonna pop one off in the ceiling. My second thought is, I'm pretty sure that's not in the California curriculum for elementary education. So you, you, you have to keep the gun put up. It has to stay concealed. You can't have a teacher going around showing the latest and greatest Whackmaster 5000 and showing off. If something like that happens, there needs to be consequences and repercussions. And last is gear, and gear is the easy part. We need a reliable fighting pistol. We need a sturdy, rigid pistol belt. We need a, a quality holster with good retention, and we'll need an extra magazine, not because we got to shoot a whole bunch of people, but to fix our guns if they malfunction. So in conclusion, I've explained how arming teachers would be a very viable option for t protecting our children, and I spoke about the mindset, training, cost, anonymity, and gear that we're facing to try to get this implemented. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, next I'd like to introduce Michael Woodland, and he's going to be teaching practicality of training and myths. Oh, yeah.
Galaxy. Once again, my name is uh, Michael Woodland, and today we're going to talk about practicality of training and myths. All right. Can anybody go ahead and rattle off three myths they heard throughout their lifetime revolving around firearms? You don't aim a shotgun. Say again. You don't have to aim a shotgun. You don't have to aim a shotgun. Anybody? All you got to do is rack it. It'll scare them away. That's my favorite, right there. All right. Somebody, give me one more. All Glock shoot left. Oh, go actually love it. I might say <laughs> test it out. <laughs> All right, so right now, today, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the myths of recoil concerning the flinch. Drop firing damages your firearm and where and what you should do as far as training. All right, so now I'm going to call on you right quick, Steve. Yes. Can you tell me what you think the flinch comes from? Big loud noise, you think it's going to happen, so you're Kind of trying to protect your face and your head, okay. moving away, jerking away, pulling All away. Right. So a little bit of a conditioned response. Okay. So for for some of us who do not know what conditioned response is, it's just you condition yourself to respond to something happening, which is the bang, which is your flinch. All right. So um, Micah, can you help me out right quick? Yes, sir. What is the one way we can get rid of the flinch? Good way to get rid of the flinch is to stagger dummy rounds in with live rounds in a magazine so they don't know which ones are going to be live and which ones are going to be dummy. The muzzle will dip noticeably if they're flinching when they're pulling the trigger. Yep, so dummy once round. again, it's just another resource and a tool to help get rid of something that is irritating that is not needed when shooting. Thanks a lot for that. Great explanation right there. So, is it fair to say? that the flinch is not biological response. Yeah. Is that fair to say that? Mm -hmm. All right, so we just got rid of one minute, okay? So now, I'm a new shooter. I got my new gun. I'm going to the range, all right? So now when I go to shoot, this is how I'm gonna hold my gun. I'm going to the range and I'm shooting as such. All right, Glenn. Can you tell me what would take place if I was to shoot like this? Uh, you're limp wristing, you'll, you won't hit your target, you might, yeah, it's not a good situation. Okay, so by me not knowing what I'm effectively doing, this right here might cause me to flinch because I don't know what's going on at this moment. Everybody with it? Yeah. All right, so um, Mongo, can you properly talk me through the correct way or the more preferred way to hold a firearm. Yeah. Okay. Grab it high in your dominant hand so that the web of your hand is right underneath the slide. Okay. So you're right under the bore axis and then use a C clamp grip causing the back strap and the front of the grip to have the most pressure put on it. Okay. And with your other hand, fill the gap on the, the empty gap on the other side so that both thumbs are pointed down range. And close your fingers around your hand with a C-clamp grip on the other side. All right. So now, if I was to effectively shoot anything, or if I was to shoot anything with this, would it be more effective compared to what I did the first time? Yeah. All right. Because right here, I got positive control of the recoil. All right. So the gun is not going to be flopping around, jumping in my hand. And of course, if somebody's in your ear and they're talking, they will effectively understand you're not going to get hurt when shooting the firearm and holding it properly. Great explanation, appreciate that. All right, how many other people heard that um, dry fire will destroy your firearm? All right, everybody heard it, okay? So, honestly speaking, I think it's 50-50 with the arguments that I heard, you know, you know, in the past and today, okay? So, Joe. Yeah. Can you help me out right quick? Yeah. Okay, so I want you to tell me a gun you shoot regularly do you drop fire it? And how many issues came about it from drop fire? Um, so I go actually back and forth with two, uh, Glock 19 and a SIG 226. The reason being, uh, Clint Smith tells us to be students of weapons craft. I want to have uh, an ability to shoot anything, whether it be a striker fire, single action trigger, double fire, or double action trigger. Uh, I've never had any problems with either of them through thousands of cycles of dry fire. Okay. Mike, can you answer that same question? When you shoot regularly, do you drop fire it, and have you had any issues with drop fire? 
Yeah, I shoot a and, a, and carry a Smith & Wesson uh, M&P 2.0 9 c or 9 compact, and I've never had any issues at all with dry fire. I've had thousands and thousands of reps, drawing, presenting, and uh, dry firing that striker fired pistol, and have never ran into an issue uh, that was caused by that. Okay, so right there you got two different experiences, two different locations. We never talked about that topic before in my <coughs> presence. So, therefore, me personally, I dry fire all the time. I don't think dry fire injures your weapon in any way. But if you do have that concern that dry fire does damage your weapon, you could use snap caps as a resource. All right? Now, where should you train? All right, of course, if we go to the range and we put up a target and we stand in front of it and we just shoot it. That is not realistic training. Okay, so first thing you got to do is find a reputable school to go to, get the training, all right? Get the training to learn a new skill, all right? After you go to that school and you attain that new skill, all right, your toolbox is full. Go home and practice. Your practice can lead from anything to um, trigger manipulation, magazine changes, and drawing from the holster. Another resource that you can effectively use is compete in your local IDPA and USPSA matches. All right. The reason why I personally like the um, IDPA and USPSA matches, they use real world scenarios or an outline that makes it a real world encounter, whereas you effectively got to think and engage a target. All right. So look into it. All right. So how many of us have also heard that gun owners are anti-social? Bad guys of the world. You want to stay away from them because they're just bad, all right? Crystal, yeah. if you don't mind, can you share with me or everybody your first encounter at a gun range? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so there were a couple of confused looks, like what's a woman doing on the range, but it wasn't negative. It was a, oh, you don't see that very often. And uh, outside of that, and after they got over that initial shock, everyone was really helpful, really kind, um, just excited to share their passion. Okay. Yeah. All right. James, do you mind sharing your first experience at a gun range? It was so long ago, I can't can't remember it. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. So, um, my first encounter at a gun range was nothing but positivity. All right, it was just positive. When I first went out there, everybody was willing to flood me with where to go to get the best prices on firearms, ammunition, and gear. All right, so head to the gun range, gun stores, talk to the people, talk to the people. All right, now. Has anyone ever experienced a drop firearm going off? All right, how many of us have been to training before and a firearm's been dropped? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Happens, happens right all here. the time. Happens all the time. So it's nothing to be scared of, okay? Now, during that brief, you probably hear the instructor say something along the lines of, hey, if you drop the firearm, right, just get an instructor to observe you picking it up. Okay? And the only reason being is it's just for the safety consideration so if somebody has their eyes on you to make sure you're not picking it up and putting your finger in the trigger. Right? So if you put your finger in the trigger, first thing they're going to say, hey, put your finger out the trigger. Oh, okay. Just pick it up and continue your training. All right? So in conclusion, we got practice and training. Okay? We already debunked the myths. So right now we're on practice and training. All right? So now what we want to do is we want to go seek out a reputable school get some training, turn around, build a skill, right? After we build that skill, we wanna go home and practice to reinforce that skill. So now when we go back out, everything is much more of an improvement. Does anybody have any questions? No. All right, so moving forward, I wanna to introduce to you my buddy Glenn. And Glenn is gonna talk about the citizenship of sheepdog. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a great presentation. First of all, my name is Glenn, and I am a recovering Glock tired. 
So I'm going to expect, I want to set the bar low just to go initially with this. You ask, how did I know that? Well, it's pretty obvious when I tried to uh, install a titanium firing pin in my blue gun. <laughs> that was unsuccessful. It's a Gen 5, anybody's jealous. We're going to have a little discussion today. Choosing your first fighting rifle. That's the title of the presentation. <clears throat> what is a fighting rifle? Does anybody, anybody quickly, what is a semi-automatic rifle? rifle? A semi-automatic rifle that feeds from a box magazine and uses an intermediate cartridge. There we go. An intermediate cartridge is what caliber? 223, 556, 762 by 59, 39 generally. So we're going to deal with two main questions here. The AR platform, AR-15 versus the AK-47 platform. And then we're going to deal with building versus buying. First of all, though, I'm going to show you guys what this looks like because it's always great to see stuff. We'll start out with the not-so-blue gun AK-47 for everyone out there. This is it. It's got a very distinct features here, very identifiable. The AR-15, <clears throat> this is an actual blue, blue gun. You can see it right here. Very familiar looking, this is America's rifle. So you've seen them. And for those, you gotta make a choice. You gotta pick a fighting rifle. And there are two very, very different philosophies behind the design and production of these. First of all, one is the AK-47 is Russian. The AR-15 is from the United States. So very quickly, just some brief outline. I wanna give a softball question to Mongo. Mongo, what year was the AK-47 designed? It's been a tough week for him, but... Uh, I don't know, Jed, I have to say 1847. Yeah, well, it's funny, because uh, that's a great answer. Wouldn't that have been interesting? The world, the world history would be very different if that were the truth. <laughs> and so here we go, quick facts. Designed at 40, between 46 and 48, produced in 49, a hundred million AK family variants are out floating around in the world. Uh, steel cased ammo weighs 3.5 Ks. And uh, let's see, the effective range is 350 meters. It's, it's, the muzzle velocity is 2350 feet per second. There's some technical stuff here, but that's okay. Don't have to get all that. So the AR 15. Eugene Stoner debuted in Vietnam. The year was 56. It was designed. It was awesome because you could carry a ton of ammo. The problem it was solving was heavy ammo. They wanted a small caliber, high velocity round to carry a ton of that. There were problems. Muzzle velocity is 3,300 feet per second. Weighs 2.9K. 500 yard uh, uh, range, more or less. You know, these are just these are standard terms, and uh, it's mil spec. Everything's the same on an AR-15. The parts are interchangeable, like a Lego set, which I'll talk about later. So, ballistically, the effective range. We're gonna, we're gonna compare these quickly so you can make a decision. The, the range, AR, AK. We talked about that, the AR is, what was it, 650? The AK was 250. But the thing about this, you gotta take into consideration, statistically, most of your engagements are gonna be within 250. If you're shooting out to 650, you should probably just run away from the situation instead of engaging because there's all sorts of tactical ideas there. <clears throat> so we've got cost of the rounds. 
That plays into it, that's even. Availability, that's pretty even. Weight, 5'5", five, 6'2", five, 2, 2, 3, which are the same but different. Technically, it's the same one. Uh, they are, you know, they're lighter. So, in a general sense, reliability. The AK-47 is known to be very reliable, and the AR-15 is reliable also. They're just sort of different philosophies, maintenance-wise. The manual of arms, and when I refer to manual of arms, essentially, those are the movements one makes to engage the trigger, to put the safety on and off, to reload and such. Very important, they are once again different, but with training, that's all very manageable. Field maintenance. Maintaining in the field, breaking down once again with, 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 with training, that's gonna work out well. I mean, it does take effort, but the AR, the AK is more reliable. Replacement parts, modularity, these are all factors to take into consideration. And the cool factor. Boy, that's, that's one thing where they, they deviate. I mean, this is way cool for very, very different reasons. It's retro. The AR course, once again, is very, it's for a whole different set of reasons, is extremely attractive. And what's amazing is the AR, the AK, on Wikipedia has been in the pay, the list of wars it's been involved in is four times the AR-15. So, very quickly, if you're going to buy an AR, that was the second part of this, buy versus build. If you're not technically inclined, you should probably buy one, uh, especially an AR. Because, I mean, this is, you know, we are here in the States. You've got lots of different options. The low-end ones aren't bad. The upper ones are great. Spend the money, but the problem there is that money might be better spent here at some place like Tactical Response with James Jager. Getting your mindset straight. You can have the fancy this or that, and you can spend three, four grand. So, as far as buying, the AK gets a little more interesting. There's some bands that are, in, that are around now that have been around. But we, they are manufactured domestically, Century Arms. But that, the AK is stronger if you've got some funds to dedicate. Rifle Dynamics, Krebs, you can get a battle ready, just ass kick an AR, AK from those guys. So from that, from the buy perspective, go with the AR. Build perspective, very different. Those that are technically inclined, you can build your own weapon. That's great because you can understand everything about it. If it breaks down, you'll be very valuable in all sorts of situations. The AR is like a Lego set. Mill spec, everything's interchangeable. The AK is sort of, you need some mojo mechanically. There's lots of stuff, trunnions and drills and this and that that can go wrong. So kits to get an AR or just tongue the uppers and lowers, boy, you can get those everywhere. The AK is not so much. The tools, you gotta buy a bunch of tools to build an AR. Complexity, as I mentioned. There, you know, the AR is a bit complex. The AK is more complex, but in a way funner. <clears throat> and so in summary, you need all of us to choose a fighting rifle. Those that are choosing their first, you gotta, these are some basic decisions that are gonna be having, having to be made. Very important, in my mind, the AK wins simply because of ballistic punch. The 7.62 by 39 caliber within the what your statistically engagement range is gonna be more effective. That's nothing against the AR. I mean, that, that, they're, just, they're, they're amazing in so many ways. Build, ooh, that's tough. The AR is also is super fun to build like a Lego set. It's interchangeable. The AK takes some more effort, but it's definitely worth it. If possible, try to get both, learn the manual of arms, but as we've all been learning here in the last five days, focus your funds, go, you know, find a threshold to spend and then focus the funds on training, specifically mindset, tactical response. So next I would like to introduce 
Crystal Adams. She's going to talk about adaptive shooting. And yes, I am follically challenged, if anyone was wondering. For some reason, the hair on my head has migrated to my back. I filed a complaint with the proper authorities. All right, hello. As you mentioned, my name is Crystal, and I am from Louisville, Kentucky. Yes, I said Louisville, not Louisville, not Louisville. It's pronounced Louisville, just for the record. All right, so today I'm so excited to be here talking to you about something that is really close to my heart, and that is adaptive shooting. Uh, so today I want to share with you what exactly that is, what experiences I've had with it, and the one thing that it won't really work for. So I want to start with a couple of scenarios. Uh, the first is you have a friend that after so much time of you trying to convince them to get to the range and try shooting, they finally want to go but they are so nervous. How many of you in this room feel like you could teach this person? I think all of you could. Yeah, definitely. So that's number one. Number two is you have a friend who is blind, who has had a recent amputation, still wants to learn to shoot. How many of you in this room think that you could teach that person? Yeah, some of you, most of you. Well, good, I'm here to tell you that you can, right? And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have some ideas on how to do that. Uh, another question I have about these two people in particular, do they have a right to the same independence that all of us have? Yeah. Yeah? 100%. Yeah. Do they have a right to the same freedoms? Yes, yes. Hell yeah, mm -hmm. right? Uh, do they have the right to the ability to protect themselves? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. So I have kind of a, a unique connection to this idea that everyone has the ability to protect themselves. And that's because of what I do on a daily basis. Uh, not only am I a firearms instructor and a shooter uh, myself, mostly for self-defense, but I'm also an occupational therapist. So for those of you all that are not quite sure what that is, A, I do not help people find jobs. Okay. B, I am not a physical therapist. Although sometimes I do resemble a physical therapist and sometimes I do help people find jobs. But you know, <laughs> that's the job. So I get to do all kinds of cool stuff with people. Uh, but the bottom line in this profession is I get to help people live their most independent and successful lives. That is so meaningful to me. and so meaningful to the people that I get to work with. So to be able to combine that passion with my passion for shooting is a dream come true for me. Uh, so that's really led me to this area called adaptive shooting. Now I'm sure some of you have heard this term. Uh, if not, it's very simply exactly what it sounds like. Adapting shooting. So you're taking the act of shooting and adapting it somehow so that someone that may not otherwise be able to shoot is able to. This applies to everybody. Those of you that say, oh, I've never made an adjustment, never made an adaptation, guess what? Have you chosen a gun that you like to shoot? That's an adapt adaptation, right? So this applies to everyone from those of us that um, are typical and have no limitations, uh, or someone who has no use of their body. Uh, so I really want to share some of the most common experiences that I have with this concept. Uh, so these are things that when I'm working with students very often come up. So I'm just going to run through these and by the end you're going to see that it's really the same thing you would typically see. Uh, it really doesn't require any kind of extra equipment or big changes in technique. Uh, but it's good information to know and odds are you're going to run into this. So the number one thing I hear students say is, I can't rack the slide. Uh, first off, let's talk about that word can't. Throw it out of your vocabulary. My students come to me and they say, I can't do something. And I say, um, yeah, you can. And they're like, but I can't. And then I make them do it. And guess what? They do it. Yeah. 
Imagine, you all know when you do something that you never thought that you could do, that sense of independence. It's amazing, right? Yeah, it's awesome. So throw that word can't right away because you don't need it. So back to I can't wrap the slide. So uh, a lot of times I see this in students that have arthritis or for some other reason, some kind of weakness, right? Uh, and it's a very simple fix. It's just a, a little bit of a change in technique. So instead of holding my gun here and racking the slide, uh, I just have them do that and also push forward at the same time. So it's like this opposite movement. So many times that it's so much easier for them, just that little bit of extra force. And guess what? They just did what I told them they were gonna do. Mind blowing, right? But a really cool thing to see. Uh, something else I very commonly see is a problem with uh, managing the recoil from a weapon. So uh, those of you all in the room, what would you typically think would be the problem? Limp wristing. Limp wristing, anything with grip, right? Some kind of poor grip. Well, I've had students that have a perfect grip and it's still very, very difficult for them to manage. Um, this could also be because of weakness. It could be uh, from something like rheumatoid arthritis that affects all the tiny joints in the hands, um, something like carpal tunnel syndrome affecting the wrists. Um, any kind of pain in this area of the body can cause this. And so having a proper grip may not help that. Um, this is pretty close to my heart. My mom actually has rheumatoid arthritis. And so uh, for the longest time, she said, no, I don't want to shoot. I don't, it's gonna hurt. Guess what she does now? She shoots, yeah. So we found what was gonna work for her and we did that by uh, finding a, a firearm that was comfortable for her to shoot, first of all, and then finding a caliber that she was comfortable with. So that reduction in force can be very useful. Something else I very commonly see is back pain. Uh, this is typically gonna come from stance. Uh, so when a student says to me, well, I can't shoot more than a couple rounds at a time. Hey, there's that word can't again. And I'm like, no, 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 you're going to. That's something about me you all will quickly figure out. You tell me you can't do something and you will do it. Uh, so they say, all right, I can't do that. So I go to the range with them and I say, just show me, show me how you shoot. What do you all think they do when they stand? Mm. Yeah, they're all like, <clears throat> <laughs> that hurts my back, jeez. So that's typically a very easy fix. Um, if they are uh, standing properly, like they have a good isosceles stance and their back still hurts, again, simple fix. Usually they can just take a step back and it'll take the pressure off of their lower back. So simple fix there as well. Uh, another common issue I run into is um, students that could really benefit from the simplest possible gun. Uh, this is often because they're a new shooter, maybe they're nervous, uh, pretty overwhelmed with guns, so you want them to have to think of as little stuff as possible. So someone shout out something that you might recommend for this. Glock. Glock, Glock 19? Glock 19. I mean, that's the answer to everything, right? What's the best gun? Glock 19. What gun would you recommend? Glock 19. Why the chicken cross the road? Because Glock 19, 19. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, always the answer. But why? It's because it's ridiculously simple to use, right? So simple. There's no extra safeties to deal with, um, really nothing besides pointing and shooting. So that's a huge benefit. Uh, sometimes I do have students that are not even comfortable with a semi-automatic period. They want a revolver, and those are very simple to use. So that can be a good solution as well. Uh, another issue I see uh, pretty, pretty often is some kind of shoulder pain. So of course my OT side is like, oh, let me add it. Let's figure that out. Let's get you feeling better. Uh, but in the meantime, a big issue that these people have with shooting is actually drawing from a holster. So I'm going to stand here, um, I'm just going to stand in one place so that you all can really see the way my shoulder moves. So let's say I carry on my hip. I go to draw, what's my shoulder do? Do you all see that movement? 
it's, it's a big range of movement, right? Um, so if someone has difficulty and pain drawing because of their shoulder, what's an easy solution? Move the holster. Huh? Move the holster. Move the holster. Move the holster where? Appendix. Appendix, yes. So the difference between drawing from here versus drawing from here, it's not really moving, right? Simple fix there as well. And I know some of us in this room have had experience with that personally. Um, so it is super easy fix and very convenient. Uh, I also see a lot of chronic diseases. Uh, by this I mean stuff like the rheumatoid arthritis I mentioned earlier. Uh, multiple sclerosis is another one. I've had a few students with that condition. And if you don't know anything about it, it can get pretty tough. You wake up on any given day and you have no idea how your body is going to feel, how it's going to function. That makes life difficult, let alone shooting and worrying about your ability to defend yourself. Pretty stressful, but still possible. Uh, you want uh, for these people to find a, a firearm that's really, really easily operated, like stupid simple for them. They have way more than enough strength, way more, more than enough every kind of skill. That way, if they do have a bad day, they're still able to manipulate it. I have one student in particular that uh, loves carrying a semi-auto, and that is his main carry. Uh, but there are days where he is not comfortable with his ability to manipulate that weapon. Uh, so on those days, he'll carry a revolver, which is kind of iffy. That's a big switch, depending on the day. Uh, but this student really does a great job of training. So he has double the weapons, double the training. He trains a lot for that so that he'll be prepared. So uh, any kind of chronic disease, also very manageable. And those are really the main issues I see on the range. Uh, there are some less common uh, impairments that are maybe more severe might need some um, extra equipment, for example. And these are really, really meaningful cases because a lot of times these are with shooters that have recently been through some kind of big injury. Maybe shooting was a huge part of their life and they were in this big accident and it was just taken away. They lost their ability to shoot. Can you all imagine that? Just think for a second. If I was just like, no, no, I'm taking your ability to shoot. Can't shoot anymore. Um. He's giving me an evil eye. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not comforting. A, you're more vulnerable. B, you're li likely losing a huge part of yourself and your identity. So working with these people that have lost that is more than just, hey, let's go to the range and learn to shoot. It's giving a part of themselves back to them, helping them regain that and regain that independence, that freedom, that ability to protect themselves. Uh, there are really three things that you will typically see in this category. The first is gonna be some uh, kind of paralyzation. Uh, so maybe someone does not have full use of their arms, for example. So that's the easy fix, typically. Uh, you can modify your gear. Um, Maybe you put in a lighter trigger, right? Simple, doesn't require as much strength. Uh, maybe you shoot from support instead of offhand, right? Um, easy solutions. But maybe these people don't have any use of their arms. Guess what? They can still shoot a gun. Uh, so even if they just can breathe on their own, they can operate a weapon. Uh, there are switches that work with just a puff of air, so, right? I can set some kind of equipment up where I can use that to fire a weapon. And now, if you all are out there thinking that is crazy, how in the world does that work? Uh, I encourage you to remember Stephen Hawking and everything that he's capable of, right? Did he move his body? No. No, right? So all this stuff is possible. Uh, another great tool for this population is visualization. Those of you all that aren't familiar, that's really just um, visualizing yourself doing something without physically doing it. Uh, and if you're doubting the power of this tool, 
Let me give you a little example. I want to share a research study with you. Uh, a man was in a very bad accident, lost all control of his body. Uh, the doctors that he was working with decided to put a chip in his brain to help him regain his control. Uh, for four days after the surgery, he was tasked with visualizing himself doing things. So where do you all think he was at four days after the surgery? Any idea? Pretty weak. Pretty weak, yes. So he was very weak. He did not have control of his body, but what he was able to do in only four days, take in mind rehabilitation takes months, if not years, but four days after the surgery, he was able to control a cursor on a computer screen, which means he was able to communicate with people. He was able to tell them what he wants and needs. And that was the start of him regaining his independence. So this stuff is possible. Uh, and all of those things are available tools if you're working with someone who is paralyzed. Uh, something else you'll see a decent amount of is amputation. Again, a pretty simple fix. Uh, you can either, if they have their other hand, help them learn with their other hand. Uh, if that's not an option, or maybe they're still kind of weak and they want to shoot handguns but don't quite have the stability yet, uh, you can use a pistol brace. You all might know this is that thing that you may or may not be able to shoulder at any given moment. <laughs> that thing. Yeah. So that's for amputations. Uh, the other really kind of big population that you're going to see in this category is um, people who have a vision impairment or blindness. Do you all actually need to see to be able to shoot? I didn't say shoot well or shoot a target. Do you need it to shoot a gun? Nope. No. No, exactly. So uh, vision impairment really occurs on a spectrum. So on the higher levels, you have people that are slightly visually impaired. Maybe they can just use a, a, a different set of sights that's easier for them to see. So can anyone that knows James Yeager recommend a set of sights? Big dots. Yeah, this right here. Perfect, right? Very visible. Great idea. Uh, once you get into the more severe vision impairment, there are still solutions. Uh, oftentimes we focus on the close quarters training with these people because if, if someone's attacking me, do I need to see them if I can feel them? No. Right? I'm going to be able to feel their body and feel where to shoot. So, yeah. And the bottom line for all these people is finding a solution that gives them comfort and the ability to manipulate a weapon. That's the bottom line. Uh, so hopefully by now you see that we really can work with any impairment in shooting, except for one. The only disability that exists in shooting is a poor mindset. It's kind of like that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Why won't the horse drink the water? Because it doesn't want to. It doesn't want to. It has no motivation. And that is so often the issue when, with people with poor mindset. So the cool thing is you can actually work with them to help them find that motivation. And if you can help them find a strong enough motivator, their mindset will change. Now, there will still be those students that don't change their mindset. Those will be the only students you work with that you will not be able to teach. They will not learn because they choose not to. And that's what makes a poor mindset the only disability that exists in shooting. So at this point, I hope you see the importance of remaining open to any possibility in shooting. Not only could it help you help a student, it can make you yourself a better shooter. And who doesn't want that, right? Uh, I also hope that you remember there really is only one true disability in shooting, and that is that poor mindset. So next time you hear someone say, I can't shoot because whatever BS reason they give you, be open to helping them find a solution that's going to work for them. It very well may be a matter of life and death. Thank you. Give her a hand.
All right, so YouTube, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Don't beat these guys up very badly. Uh, again, uh, if they if they have YouTube channels, I'm going to put those links up. I've already put underneath uh, the order of presentations and stuff like that. And I'll go back if I have time and put timestamps so you can go to the ones that you want to see and stuff like that. But I will tell you that all these guys improved greatly from the beginning to the end. As some of them were already good speakers, but they maybe like this or that, and some of them were bad at everything, um, like uh, like Steve. But <laughs> <laughs> appreciate you guys watching, and uh, again, be nice. These are fledgling instructors trying to trying to make their way in the world. Crushing their spirits now won't help them. So don't be the dickhead that counts the ums. <laughs> this is, this is what you're looking at. This this is the crew, and they're uh, they're ready to fucking stop this damn recording. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's remember what would, what did I say about the live stuff? Make sure what when you do, when you stop a live stream, make sure you do what actually actually turn it actually.